Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 362 of Spit and Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney. My friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here on the Barstool Sports Podcast family. What's up, everyone? We had a very eventful few days in the league. Looked more like slap shot than it has in years. Fighting, biting, helmets tossed, gloves thrown in a huge fire. And this club has everything. But first, let's check on the boys, see how their holiday went. Mikey G, how was Turkey Day for you, buddy? Uh, Turkey Day was great. Black Friday, even better. Special shout out to the Chicklets Nation. Always having our back. So, uh, yeah, I had a great weekend. Good good to hear. Good to hear. Biz, how was your American Thanksgiving? Uh, when you said this club has everything, what's that from, R.A.? Is that Fight um, Club? No, um, the SNL segment with Bill Hader when he used to do Steph Wine, when he would talk okay. about clubs. This club has, it's, you must know that one. I could see your relative. wheels turning when you were doing the intro, buddy, and a great job. What an eventful week in the NHL. And weird, I think it's every, you know, when you hit that uh, Thanksgiving mark, all of a sudden the wires cross and it comes to playoff race. And after that, we've uh, already mentioned an eventful week. We had that glove toss. We had the biting. I got to go see the Coyotes game on Saturday against the Dallas Stars. So it was all hockey Sorry mostly. <laughs> it was a great game. Dallas playing really well after that closed door meeting. Remember when I texted the group chat? I said, hammer the Dallas Stars the next game after. Why are you, why are you laughing? Because you were 100% right. Anytime you have a closed door meeting, usually things turn around, especially with a team like the Dallas Stars. I think they've won four in a row now, but uh, Coyotes play well. And then I spent the rest of my weekend uh, getting help from, from G and yourself with uh, the latest Sandbagger. Ooh. Sandbagger 10 with Trevor Zegris. And Cole Caulfield. Some people chirping, uh, you know, all oh, your first sandbagger with an AHL or nope. Cole got called up and he's been on a little bit of a point streak too. So uh, a great weekend for uh, for me and very excited for the fans on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Before all the Eastern games start, we are going to launch that. Wit will be live in the, in the chat. I'm sure chirping my putting stroke, chirping my backswing, but um, you guys will you guys will enjoy that for sure. Presented by Pink Whitney and Roman. Can't forget that pot biz. Okay. Wait, how was your Thanksgiving, my man? Oh, it was phenomenal. Just to one of those, like, all of a sudden from Wednesday night, like, it's Sunday night. You're like, what the hell's the past four or five days been? Like, a lot of drinking, a lot of great food, friends, family. A phenomenal time. Biz. Not every closed-door meeting ends up with a nice response from the, the club who's looking to get on a winning streak and get things back on track because – we had about seven of them within four months one year in Edmonton. And by the end, we were like playing connect four with each other. Fucking, uh, what are we going to talk about? There's nothing left. Um, yeah, the, 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 the season right now is as exciting. Hey, the 17th guy saying the same thing as the 16 yeah, it's guys. Like, Wait, what do you think again? You're like, oh, just effort level. And, you know, we got to get back on the back track. Help out. Help out us defense, please. So, um, what else? Yeah, the league, the league's nuts. I've been following it. Obviously, a lot of football going on. Got roasted. Bet against Michigan. I actually like Michigan. Michigan's my team. Like, if I had a college football team, I really like Michigan. But they lose every single year. is pathetic. I remember last year, I said, fuck this team. I'm done. So I bet against them. And, of course, they just roll over Ohio State. Just a horrible beat. I was almost happy, right? It's one of those losses. I was happy for Michigan. But a um, little upset about that. Uh, what else? Other than that, I hammer. I, I was I had the Pats yesterday, the Packers. I'm on fire in that in that regard. That's a nice thing to hear. I know you guys are excited for me that I'm winning some money. Um, <laughs> oh, Marshawn, Marshawn, I uh, I pumped his tires on Twitter because I had just watched. I was flipping back and forth, watched most of Bruins Vancouver. He is incredible in leading this unreal third period comeback. Like the nastiest plays, dangles, assists, scores a beautiful goal. And I'm pumping his tires on Twitter. Little did I know he's now going to be suspended probably for a slew foot that I missed. <laughs> so people are coming at me online and, you know, Panarin threw the glove at him. So, yeah, there's a million things to catch up on. I'm just rambling a little bit, but nice to see you guys. Is that why Panarin ended up throwing the glove at him? I know well, he Panarin said that threw he... the glove at him because he said something about Russia, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Russian. So I, I guess we're never yeah. getting him on the podcast. Okay, geez. Okay, well, there you go. All right, what was your uh, Thanksgiving like? Um, you know, it was actually very nice not to get sentimental, but it was the first time in, I think, 45, 46 years that me, my brother, my mother, my father were all together because my parents divorced when I was a little kid. And my, my dad's a, a widower now since, you know, since last Thanksgiving. So it was really special. It's, uh, you know, you, you, something I haven't done in a long time. My sister was there, too. So it was it was much more special than typical Thanksgiving. And then Friday I had a wedding. Um, that's you saw the suit online. I mean, boys, I, I was looking pretty good. 
me and BY hooked up, had a, had a couple pups together. His cousin's wedding. I know his cousin's mother very well, longtime family friend. Had an awesome time. And boys, it was so good because everyone's been so cooped up with COVID. And you get to my age, sometimes the only time you see your friends, the wakes and funerals and shit. So it was just awesome to have like a festive occasion, a party. And Keith's mother, man, Patty, she's a fucking trip. Me and her. Patty Party and her uh, sister we were, Karen Cocktail. They're the yeah, best. Uh, we, were, <laughs> we, were, cocktails. we were cutting up a rug uh, for, for quite a while. I was going to yeah. ask you, were you dancing already? Uh, what were you getting going to? Uh, it, well, it was whatever was old, man, because when they play the new shit, I don't know. And I, I was like, oh, God, I could take a breather here. I need I need a breather here. But uh, anything old that, that I like, but it was just just fucking awesome atmosphere. And then there was an after party, then another after party. All right. Uh, you get leaking as it is. I can only uh, imagine how much you're leaking on that dance for well, what, what, what was good is you could run right right outside what have you been the red lion in in, in cohasset beautiful spot there? i i i tried getting a job there after i got fired being the bus boy at atlanta but beautiful spot <laughs> uh, unreal spot for you? a wedding they didn't even <laughs> look at your resume with i guess not they were like this kid knocked over a fucking waiter and knocked a hundred dollars of food on the ground we're not hiring him at red lions classy establishment yeah, actually what i spent the night in situate uh, did you? It, yeah, I, I I stayed at the inn at Situate Harbor. That's that's where I booked. Was you know I'm not going to drive back to Boston. Bu- no, Buffalo, God no, where. God no. All yeah. sweaty. I'm nice still picturing on RA on the on the dance floor. You, I mean, I know Grinelli's seen that that video with that guy. He's got to be on Molly, and he's just sweating, and he's got the shaved head, and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> "You've seen it, wit for sure, and all." It's like the viral clip of the, the, yeah, the yeah, random yeah. guy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I really like. I feel like he would dance like the way he danced when he was singing that that karaoke with with the Rolling Stones in Philly. Like he just like shakes a little. Like he probably tries to be Mick Jagger. Yeah, no, only only when the Stones are on. They, I oh, didn't hear okay. them at all. I, I, Jagger was prepped. If the Stones come on, I was ready to go. But he didn't come on. What's your go-to? You know, what? You know right? what, dude? Quickly, my yeah, buddy went to the. Well, hold on, the but my buddy uh, Donnie went to the Stones. Uh, they were in Fort Lauderdale, I think, this past weekend. It might have been their last show of the tour. I don't know. But either way, it's coming to an end for them at some point. And a couple brawls broke out there. He's next to guys that are just tilting during a Rolling Stones concert. I That's mean, how do you crazy. end up That's fighting? That's called a mosh pit. They weren't happy with some of the songs they pissed, picked from the playlist, I guess. But <laughs> just thought of that. They thought Sorry, Fuji's man. were opening. They got, well, <laughs> they got a little bit rowdy. Well, speaking Actually, of rock, I'll be gone to yeah, November. I'm even gonna... mentioned, uh, and this one's a little bit more sad. The, well, obviously more sad. The, the Travis Scott show, all right? Did you end up hearing about that? They just oh. didn't have the proper security, and and it was a, a fucking shit show. And I think like I think like a, a dozen kids ended up passing. Yeah, away. off awful story. Just just terrible planning. Well, like, I guess that's things. kind of been a theme with his with his I don't know videos or whatever. People crashing the gate, just a disaster. But let's talk about rock stars, Biz, because you might be the newest one. Biz Hetfield on TNT oh doing God. a little duet with uh, Hank Lundquist, looking like a mob soldier with your all black and pink <laughs> tie. That was fucking hilarious. How, How pre-planned that? was that? How about that shirt tie combo wit? <laughs> I was I, I was at least like at least he's on the pink Whitney type thing, or is that even why he's doing this? Like why did so that was like the, that? the the for the month of November. It's hockey fights cancer. So they actually gave me a a, a a vineyard vines tie. Yeah, bro. Why'd you wear a black suit and a black shirt with it? I don't know. I don't that's a great cry. <laughs> I just don't I know. know the tie was pink for hockey fights cancer. The, the rest of the outfit is like, why were you looking like a bad guy villain from she's all that movie? In like 93, <laughs> like, like a black man in the Godfather. <laughs> oh, and then and then like during the week, Lundquist, we knew Lundquist was coming. And uh, and then he says he's bringing his guitar and he's like, you don't you know how to sing? And I'm like, absolutely not. He goes, try to learn one of these songs. And the first one was Nothing Else Matters. And I, I ended up pulling it up. I thought he was going to end up asking me live on air if they had it. This was pre-show. Uh, he was just sitting there playing. So then we, I ended up just kind of pulling up the lyrics and joking around with them. And then they ended up using the clip later on. So it looks he like just the- brought it just to like, do you think this was all planned maybe behind your back a little bit? Like, I, I, I don't know, but I had my earpiece in and I think the producer was kind of we were They were just kind of talking about the music. I think that was being played. So it kind of just gets you singing along a little bit. I didn't know the lyrics off by heart, surprisingly, although I, I grew up listening to Metallica. I think one of my favorite albums of all time and traditionalists uh, might get mad at this was the S&M Symphony and Metallica. And I want to say they had the San Francisco Symphony play and then they they matched it to with all the guitars and stuff. With it's a double a double live album. If you've never listened to it front to back, I suggest it. You and Ryder in the car on your way to get your blueberry muffins. Well, they say they say that you 
if you play like symphony, you play symphony music for like a baby. There is supposed to help him become like a genius. Or Albert whatnot. Einstein. But if I played the symphony music with Metallica, he might actually play with some balls if he ever gets into the game of hockey. He'll be in the mosh like pit. So yeah, that could like be getting that neck muscle strength <laughs> as you're headbanging at a young age. Um, I was actually so bummed out as you were singing that you stopped. Like when you stopped, and like, is that how you're supposed to do it? I was like, oh fuck, keep going, yeah, guys. Yeah, you were killing it. Well, like then, I said, man, it was all it's awkward, right? And I, and I and I didn't know the words off by heart, and I was just fucking around. So yeah, so it ended up working out. Although I looked like I was ready to go to prom, I just needed the bouquet on my my uh, my my Boot, was it on the left side, yeah, boot nail, little boot nail. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, no, another fun episode. And then and ended up flying back on Thursday. I, I, I went to my friend's house, uh, Donnie Superstein, uh, Joey's father's for Thanksgiving. And it was great, but, uh, I think we should probably roll into some hockey now. I think we've talked enough, unless there's anything else you want to mention with dog. Uh, it was Ryder's birthday yesterday. That was a blast. Turn four. Happy birthday, Ryder. Wow. Love you. Nice. I know, dude. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Like when by. we had the pod before he was born, right? Yeah, I mean, you were single when we started the bud. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> Holy That's crazy. Happy well, B-Day, right, Z? Well, boys, this holiday season is upon us, and sometimes you need to unwind. Family, stress, shopping, whatever. Head on over to your local favorite bar and make sure to order some Pink Whitney. Get a shot of the best stuff from the pregame to the after party. Pink Whitney. All right, boys, like we said, very eventful weekend in the NHL. There was all kinds of chatter coming from Montreal about the Canadians' front office situation after the brutal start, uh, and it all came to a head Sunday afternoon. GM Mark Bergevin, a.k.a. the Bergevin, was fired just four months after the team made an unlikely run to the Stanley Cup final. The team also fired assistant GM Trevor Timmons and head of communications Paul Wilson, and assistant GM Scott Melby abruptly resigned on Saturday once he was told he wasn't in the run for the GM or president of ho- hockey operations jobs. The Habs then went and hired Jeff Gordon as executive vice president of hockey operations to assure the continuity of the day-to-day operations during the search for the team's next GM. Uh, the Habs said, while the next general manager will bring significant hockey expertise to the organization, an additional criterion of that person's role will be to communicate with fans in both French and English. So the team immediately shrinks their pool of potential candidates. Patrick was the obvious name people go to. Marek said on Sunday night that there had been no communication with Waz yet. Uh, Ber- Bergevin released a statement thanking everybody. They had a press conference today. Biz, what was your take on this whole situation? Um, Wit, have you also heard the rumor of Luongo? I haven't, but you know who else speaks French? Me? Dale Biz, Dallin. fucking idiot. <laughs> Imagine Biz getting in there. All right, boys. We're going to make sure we got a DJ guy. Guys, we're going to trade. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna screw over the avalanche, and we're going to trade for Crosby. <laughs> I want Crosby. Listen to my master plan. Listen to my master plan. Enough of this protein shake stuff. We're trying to sell Pink Whitney, so get that in the stands. Well, I haven't heard of anyone besides Um, the one name, the the, the name like Briere. That's, well, Patrick Waugh, but. Yeah, Briere as well. Marek and Friedman already said that he hasn't been contacted. And I think the main reason on that one is like, for whoever gets this job, oddly enough, like, you're not the man in charge, right? Like Jeff Gordon is. Right, right. And and so, what, which is right. a positive. Actually, I, I Molson had a press today, and it was a couple notes. So Molson said, even though the new Canadians management team will feature a two-person team, it will be the GM who ultimately will have the final say in any hockey-related Ooh. decision. So it's kind of weird to have a guy above you, really? but you're still making the call. Yeah, I uh, asked if the coach was safe. Molson said, I don't make the coaching decision. Uh, but he also said, as far as I'm concerned, he's the coach and he's staying there. So, you know, these new GMs typically want their guys. So, we'll, you know, obviously we're going to wait and see what happens. I would, I would I would, say whoever is hired would be smart to lean on Gorton for any type of advice. Uh, I, I guess maybe shocked that, that, that he came out and said that the GM will have final say. Like, I don't know. I mean, like, that's that's not that crazy either. I'll, I'll let you take back over what you're going to say, though. Well, no, that kind of changes what I thought. So like, in thinking like a guy like Patrick Wall, who people mention, it's like, would he would he really be willing to like not be the one making the decisions? Now, that statement completely contradicts what I thought. So maybe whoever Gordon hires, that's basically him saying, like, I trust you to do it. But Jeff Gordon, I mean, he's like, if you don't decide built, what was, I say, was, I'm going to fire you, though. You know that. Yeah, right? it's kind of like <laughs> what, what I wonder if he heard that. He's like, wait, what? I think I think I'm still going to tell him what to do. He basically was a big part of building the Boston team. And, and the Rangers now are pretty quickly much better. Right. So, like, 
he he he's still well uh what's the word like Another another job would have easily been his, right? If they're looking for GMs in Chicago, they're looking for GMs in Anaheim. Jeff Gordon easily could have got that job. So does he want to just be the one at top? Maybe he's making even more money, so he's happy he won't have the stress. But that's the biggest thing with Montreal is the stress of this job. And Bergevin was gassed, dude. He had I don't think he had anything left. Everyone kind of knew and saw the whole vibe around him, and he didn't have a contract owner this year, lame duck. And the whole thing being that that job wears you down. And playing in Canada is one thing, and maybe it's it's no worse for wear than, than Toronto is or Edmonton where it, get, it gets nuts. But Montreal with the French and the English and how pa- passionate and how much those fans ex- expect and what they've been through, like with all these titles, they don't really exactly get down with rebuilds. So they're going to have to now. Yeah, I, I feel like this was just delayed based on the amount of uh, attacks, not even I mean, attacks might be a strong word, the amount of criticism you would face in the media and, and, and fr- from the fans. And all of a sudden you go on this magical run and I'm not trying to take anything away from the run. That was very magical with with timely scoring, incredible goaltending. And Are you, you trying to say lucky in the nice way. Well, I, I've talked to other hockey people who who kind of watch the whole thing. And like, I'm sure PJ Stock doesn't care because we actually have him coming on the, the podcast. I'm not sure if we talked in length about it, but it was just one of these magical runs where I don't think they had much business. And, you know, congratulations on the fact that they did it. Well, I think it ended up delaying the fact that this ends up happening. Um, you know, he was in control of a lot of the moves, some of which I thought were, were great moves. And But if you're unable to find these great players and build through the draft, which you know, they, they haven't really been able to do, they haven't really been able to find that number one center. I know Suzuki's stepping into that role. Now he, he, he's really popping off after that, that slump early on, but they just, you know, now, now it's like what he's created is really being seen. Although they did have a, a tough situation with Carey Price at the start of the year. It just, you know, it, it doesn't think it, it doesn't seem as if though this, this rebuild and this master plan he had planned has, has put them in a good position to win moving forward. And, uh, inevitably, uh, um, you know, they, they had, they had to let him go. And I don't know where this team goes from here though. I think it's going to be a, you know, a tough sledding for the next probably two, three years until they're able to find and, and, and build up their team through prospects and, and hopefully some good moves. So sucks for Ber- burger van. Cause I think he put his heart and soul into it and his, just his method didn't really come out to, to, to help them win the cup. Yeah. The, the way it all went down, wasn't really that surprising. I think that, the team moving forward is just they're they're in one. And I think they're near the top of the league in terms of actually like drafted talent playing for them. They're at the bottom of the league, excuse me, where they don't really draft well and they don't really produce players. And Molson said that I saw one of the tweets from someone who was at the press conference. He mentioned like, we have to get back to drafting better and, and like having guys that are homegrown throughout our, you know, our minor league system and getting guys up without having to go to free agency. You can't become a great team without, drafting well and having there's these also guys. no excuse for teams that have that much money and budget because your resources when it comes to the whole scouting department are far greater than what other organizations have so that's why there's really no excuse for it it would be the, like the exact same thing for for i'm sure the toronto maple leafs no excuse they probably have the most the biggest budget to spend in those areas much like if you look at football you don't think bill check surrounds himself with bigger staffs having more eyes in order to, to, to draft better and, and, and this and that. So it kind of like some organizations I could see it, but a team like Montreal, it's like, if you can't build through the draft, it's, it's like, you know, what, what the fuck is going on here? And as long as uh, we've really had this podcast, I've always said, I consider it so stupid at this day and age to have to hire a French speaking GM. It's like, as I already said, it limits the pool it limits who you're picking from now. Once they hired a, a president of hockey operations from Melrose, Massachusetts, and Jeff Gordon, I think they had to get at least. Maybe <laughs> if they hired a French guy as the president, he could have hired a just English-speaking GM, but they're not going two straight English goons up there in Montreal. But now it does create a little bit of a – the pool is – there's not as many candidates, right? But – I don't know. Like, if if you look at now, it's just gonna be it's gonna come down to Gordon interviewing people, and if he's not in charge, like the owner says, he's got to completely trust in somebody, and he has half the amount of picks, if not less, that he could go with if a guy didn't speak French. All right, is there anyone else you can think off the top of your head who might get the job? 
Someone pointed out on Twitter, Dale Talon speaks French. I mean, I, I don't think that, that he would hire him, but, you know, I don't know if Dale's going to get another GM. You got all these yeah. fucking GMs with the Rosetta Stone earbuds in. They're trying to learn French fucking quick so they can yeah. open up the, the, the talent pool here. Uh, pal Eric Engels, I read his, he had a great article about it. He said that uh, it's probably going to be a rookie GM. That's that's what Engels said. So it could it's probably going to be someone, well, it could be, you know, we just said Luongo, Brie, it could be someone off the grid. I don't think Wow was a GM in, in Colorado. He coached there, so... I don't know if it's going to be one of these big names or somebody we never heard about, but it's most likely going to be a rookie GM per uh, Eric Engel. So it'll be interesting, but Gordon, man, he's which a brain. Which makes to me, which, which makes, it, it, it seems to me like that would be Gordon really kind of teaching this guy while being a part of it. Yeah. Like a not mentor. giving him final say. So I don't know. That's just, that's odd. Yeah. But Montreal, well, it's, it's going to be a, a little bit of a long road here until they can get some, right? Like New York, New York has done it quicker because they won a couple lotteries. And they had the best, one of the best defensemen in the world basically say, I'm only playing for the Rangers. It's like, you got to get lucky involved in, in turning things around too. She wants to be quick. Big time. Yeah, the, the Canadians fans, you're probably looking at a rebuild, but Gordon's a brilliant hockey mind. I mean, he was basically just waiting for the right job. He's well-respected. He treats people well. He's, he's a terrific drafter. So if you, if you need a guy to rebuild your organization, he's a hell of a guy to do it. So uh, best of luck to, to him and whoever he hires. Any other further thoughts, boys, before we no. move along? Careful, he bite. <laughs> this fucking, we haven't seen this in the league in 10 years. LA's Brendan Lemieux bit Ottawa's Brady Kachuk twice during a scrap Saturday's game between the Kings and Sens. Lemieux got a five-minute match penalty, was ejected. He's going to have an in-person hearing via Zoom, which means he's looking at probably more than five games for suspension. And Brady gave us an all-time soundbite. Oh. G, want to tune it up? Can we uh, address your left hand here, obviously, uh, that's something that nobody ever wants to have to go through. Um, you didn't have to put up much of an argument, did you? It was pretty clear and pretty evident. Yeah, I mean, I, this is the, I think the only time I'm going to answer this, but I think it was the most gutless thing somebody could ever do. Um, not even children bite. It, and it's, this guy is just, you can ask any one of his teammates. Nobody wants to play with him. This guy is a bad guy, bad teammate, you know, focus on himself all the time. Um, just the guy's a joke. He shouldn't fuck it in this league it's it's this guy's got less as i know no other team wants him he's going to keep you know begging to be in the nhl but no team's going to want him this guy's just an absolute joke and just a bad guy and it's just it's it's got less but I, I can't really wrap my head around it children don't even do this this, this guy's just a bad guy and not even a good player either code of conduct broken obviously big time um how shocked were you when that happened it's outrageous. It, it, it's like I like, kids don't even do that anymore. It's babies do that, and the fact that he decides it's I don't even know what he's thinking. He's just a complete brickhead. He's got nothing up there. Bad, bad guy, bad player. But what a joke he is. So it's it's a couple more years of I don't even think it's a couple more years. He's it's ticking for him. And nobody wants him. I mean, Brickhead is an all-timer. I don't think I've ever heard anyone called a Brickhead before, but how many how many games should he get with? Biting is just, I mean, like Brady said, that's like babies bite. Like little kids don't even bite anymore. Yeah, this is a tough one um, because the suspension the last time it happened was so small. It was Yarko Rutu in 08-09. And I don't remember being in the game that, that this happened. He bit Andrew Peters on Buffalo. We were on the Penguins. But I don't know if it was after I got traded after the deadline to Anaheim or if it was throughout the year. Maybe I was there, actually. But I think he only got two or three games. And to me, it's like if he did bite down on Kachuk the way that it's pretty obvious he did. I know our boy Avery, he doesn't believe it. He says, show me bite marks or I don't believe it. You can't show me on video where, where he was bit. I, I tend to think the way he gets up and he's screaming, it's such a natural, visceral reaction that yes. he legit got bought, bit. Ten games. Ten games. That's kind of like, dude, if you're biting somebody, okay, so the day well, of age of COVID and all the new strands and shit, you're biting people? So I've, ex I've experienced kind of on, on, on both sides. So when I was in the American Hockey League, I was in a scrum in front of the net with uh, Eric Selleck. And as we went down, he ended up putting his finger in my mouth. And it just like, you know, it kind of was one of those initial reactions where I just bit down. I ended up breaking the bridge on my teeth. So I like I lost all my front teeth. And as soon as I bit him, he, ah, you know, he, and then we go off to the box. He was rattled, but he put his finger in my mouth. 
what it looked like was it kind of looked like the side of his palm was kind of pushing off on his face. And it just so happens it ended up in his mouth. And I think when you're heated in the midst of a scrap like that, when the guy's pushing down on you like that, if it, if your hand or finger does somehow get caught in the mouth, I, I, I think if, you know, if the wire is crossed, it's your natural reaction to bite it. Now, if you're saying he bit it twice and in the situation where it was kind of like the side of his palm, yeah, I'd probably say five to 10 games. And it seems like he's got an in-person hearing, which makes him makes them be able to give him six or more, right? That's what yes. he they, they offered. It, open, it opens it up, yeah. It, it, it opens it up quite a bit. Now, I think Sportsnet did a great job throughout the feed. These guys have had a history. I think they ended up going at it when, uh, when Claude, or not Claude, uh, Brendan was playing with New York. And then also they showed the clip of the fathers going at it. So I think they yeah. even crossed over as players. And I mean, we all know Pepe's reputation as a player. I think as far as the comments are concerned, Brady ended up going over the top and made it a little bit personal. Uh, I don't know what their personal run run-ins have been off the ice and, and what Brady thinks he knows about Brendan. Cause obviously we saw, uh, you know, quickie come in with the comments to back up. And I don't know if he, if we, we have those that we can roll up or you got to read them. All right. Yeah. There was, I didn't find that audio clip, but uh, John quick said, I have my own opinion about what happened or did not happen last night. And what I can tell you is that any comments that were made about pep were garbage. We all support him. And I'd rather have him on my team over that kid any day of the week. You know, you expect your teammates to support yourself. So that's yeah, and that's just a veteran move by Quickie coming over the top and and, and really taking that attention on for his teammate. I would, I would have imagined it would have been Doughty if he was healthy and playing, probably coming over in with, with those comments and making a little bit of a, a three-way family affair there. But uh, but no, I just like, Wit, do you think that that was going a little deep? And do you think Brady's going to regret saying uh, some of those things? Or you think because of the bite, it's like, absolutely not. Though That's fair game. My guess would be that he will not feel bad about the comments one bit. And it probably goes back to that 96 World Cup. Kachuk <laughs> fought Claude Lemieux. And you got to imagine... They've both probably talked relentless amounts of shit about each other to their kids since yeah, the this kids is a family were fucking affair. born. I hate Claude Lemieux. I hate that guy. Right? Brady and Matt Kachuk are those sitting around and they're watching their dad and then they see his fights. Oh, dad, what about, what about Claude Lemieux? I fucking hate that guy. And then yeah. Claude Lemieux talking to his son in French. I can't do French. I do French <laughs> Spanish when I try. He's like, I fucking hate Keith Kachuk and I'll hate his kids too. Right? So maybe there's a true hatred of each other and the family families right but the comments were kind of like oh my god just like all his teammates hate him you had to have an la king teammate come out and say something if you have an opposing player make an enormous statement that goes completely viral that every single one of his teammates hates him you, what are you gonna do not i'd respond? fake being i'd fake being sick for for a week and not drop to the rink <laughs> you just come in like guys you guys all hate me no biz you're cool when you're asleep yeah, so Matthew I mean, actually I, went, went at it with him in a prospects game a few years back, too. They didn't go toe-to-toe, but they, he had a scrimmage. He was basically sitting on him, mushing his face into the ice. So that there's definitely a little Who was this? Right? I missed there. the beginning. Ma- Who would you say? Uh, Brady's brother, Matthew, during a prospects game a few years ago. Someone posted a clip of him and, like, Lemieux, like, jostling. He was basically kind of just throwing him down on the ice. They weren't well, Lemieux going- knows what he's doing, man. I mean, that guy he pisses people off, just like his father did. And I couldn't see the actual uh, part where he did bite him because, like, the arms and the refs were kind of in the way there. But as you said, we're going back to his reaction and how fucking how much he snapped after the fact, and you could see him rolling around even more, which is a little bit rare once the refs finally get in there. But as soon as you the, the camera can see his face, he's looking at the referee, being like, "He fucking bit me! He fucking he, all the way to the penalty box." I mean, folks, we you don't you don't even need to be able to read lips to know what he was saying for crying out loud. So, uh, um, I would probably say I would probably say six games with. That's what I'm going to go with. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if they gave him 10, I'd be like, oh, I guess. The, the, I, I will say in kind of playing devil's advocate to myself, there is really no – it is a he said, he said, right? It's it's like – if You got to think – there, Are there – unless he has marks – Well, then give the Brady lead. the Oscar. Because well, That's he, what I'm saying. That's why the reaction is so, like, authentic, it seems like. But – I'm wondering if they. I'm wondering if they sent league the pictures of blatant yeah. teeth mark on his hands, and then the league's like, "All they right, five to. game. Now that's the proof." They haven't released that info though. Yeah, well, I don't. Well, I mean, I, I don't, you know, you know how we'll get 
real proof is if he ends up in the hospital. Cause I told you the guys at the time about when I uh, got in the bar fight in, uh, I think, I don't know if it was Hess village or it was in St. Kitts, but I ended up punching the guy and they, they like, afterward I ended up getting infected because a, a, a human's mouth is dirtier than a dog's mouth. Yeah. So I, I went home now keep in mind, this might've been what infected it. I poured some captain Morgan's on it thinking it was like alcohol. So that would clean it up. <laughs> So I went to, cause you know, it's like, like rubbing alcohol. I'm like, oh, okay, Captain. <laughs> so I, I can't cleaned. say I wouldn't have done the same, but fuck, yeah. it's funny so hearing it. I go to sleep and then I wake up the next day and it's like, it's all red and it's, it's definitely swollen. So I said, Hey dad, I said, my hand's swollen. I ended up closing the, my car door on it. And so he drove me to the hospital. Well, Canada, the healthcare is not that great. I sat around seven hours around the hospital, finally saw someone and the doctor's like, uh, yeah, you probably should have told us how serious this was. This is infected. I ended up spending seven nights in a hospital with what they transferred me over to. Yeah, they transferred me over to St. Catherine's. They had to like open it up, clean it all out. Next thing you know, I was on antibiotics, IVs. I ended up losing 10 pounds. And uh, and yeah, and a week later, I got released from hospital. So so if if, if Brady ends up getting uh, get, getting infected from the teeth marks there, well, then we're yeah. really going to know. It's, I don't know if you broke the skin or not, but they'll be so obvious with it. I'm sure Otto had pitches right away for evidence because you'll know. I mean, the fucking teeth marks, you can't deny when you see them. I want to so. see the pictures. I'm yeah. curious. Yeah, well, I think they're going to probably wait until Can't something comes out and they'll probably leak them afterwards. Days. Right, I before, right before I had to go to uh, – so this is I, – I talk about how dumb I was as a kid, man. This is He's the like, – hey, hey, geez, like, is, is, uh, are there any, like, nurses here, like the ones oh, on Red off. Tube? <laughs> Chili to nurses. Oh, hey, did you win the fight? Oh, oh yeah, did. one he shot out this cold, out. front front grill not rocked out. But this is what's stupid. This was the summer after I got in trouble uh, with with in Wilkes Barre. So it's just like another stupid yeah, incident. You were so dumb off the ice for a little it's, bit. So the craziest Crazy. part about everything How different your career would be. This is about seven days before I for after the before the last year of my entry level contract. We had a, a Pittsburgh summer camp for all the young guys. So I couldn't tell them obviously that this had happened. So I come, you know, I hadn't worked out in, you know, 10 days, I'm 10 pounds under uh, underweight. You know, I got this bandage on my hand. What happened? Car door. (laughs) So that they must've been like this kid. That might've been it. When, when the whole biting thing um, happened the other day, I, I rem- it reminded me of the Eric Selk situation and the time I ended up up in the, in the hospital for seven days after um, I got teeth that infected my hand. So uh, we can move oh, on. So last thing, I, I think there's more Ottawa news. I know there is actually about Matt Murray, but they stink. So, don't, you know, yeah. don't forget, like, he's also frustrated and annoyed and the whole team is because they're awful. Yeah. At yeah. this point, he might want his hand amputated. If he, you guys see the clip. couple of years. Somebody p- paid Gilbert Gottfried on, on the cameo to fucking read his quote. Did you, you guys seen that, right? The Gilbert mm-hmm. Gottfried, you know, he does that. Brady, get Jack. Yeah, I might looking, not be not... the easiest guy to listen to, but he is tough to listen to, that guy. Uh, that was pretty funny. I think he gets eight games. You know, you need you need a real deterrent. Not that guys do this frequently. Like you said, the last time was – uh. Root, uh, root two back at 09, and they said other other incidents have happened, but they were inconclusive. Although I don't know how Burrow. I like this game. Burrow. So Wit guessed ten, I got six. Ra's got eight. Grinelli, you got to mix in a an, an odd number here. Five. I'll give him five. Okay. Here we go. Bing, bing, bing. All right, boys. Well, the Canadians didn't get the bling, but you can get it at Blue Nile. Mock this holiday with something timeless: classic diamond stud earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthstone pendants, and so much more on BlueNile.com. Listen, gang, I've got my wife a gorgeous pair of diamond earrings that you've seen and an incredible tennis bracelet from Blue Nile, and they're absolutely stunning. If you're looking for a vast selection of preset diamond and gemstone jewelry, Blue Nile offers endless options ready to ship same day. Having trouble choosing? Blue Nile has jewelry experts on hand 24-7, available via phone or chat to help you find or build a memorable gift at every budget. When you commit to a piece, so does Blue Nile. Guaranteed service and repair for life. Make the seasons shine with jewelry from BlueNile.com. Shop this week and take advantage of the Cyber Week sale with select jewelry up to 50% off. Plus, now through Christmas, enjoy free two-day shipping. And as always, Blue Nile order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. So shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. 
I'll tell you, folks, I, I really legit got stuff from my wife. The stuff's fantastic. Your partner will love it. Check them out. Like I said, all different price ranges. If you want to go high, that's great. Uh, I got a nice, beautiful tennis bracelet. Good stuff. So No way. I actually yeah. ordered uh, Witt's uh, earring that he's going to be wearing after uh, the Calgary <laughs> Flames go to the second round and his fucking Oilers Jeez. take a nice, hot, steaming gotcha. dump just like the Leafs did in the past, uh, but not anymore. Oh, I love how you realize at the end there, oh, my God, I'm going to panic because he's going to crush me with Leafs facts, but not like the Leafs used to. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> 13 and two in the last 15 yeah. games. I think is it, isn't it 14 and two? They look awesome and they look differently awesome because they don't give up goals. Now they're giving up under two goals a game. They're a good team. I've said it all along, but I mean, everyone's saying like, Oh my God, like they have 33 points or no, they have three more points. Than the Oilers. 13 they've, and two in their last 15. They have, uh, they have, I believe so. They have okay. three more points than the Oilers in three more games played. That's five points for the Oilers, if not six. So we'll be three ahead of them by the time we had the same amount of games played. So don't come at me. A lot of good hockey being played right now by a lot of Canadian teams. So it's good to see. Yeah. Wagon shirts are on sale now as well. Oh, yeah. Uh Grinelli dropped an absolute wagon Toronto Maple Leafs tease. So I think they're too good to even uh, even be susceptible to a Grinelli curse on the merch side. They're not going to tank like the Sabres. So. We'll yeah. sell a bunch of those, and they'll keep winning, and they'll keep moving on, moving on up, moving on up to the east side. <laughs> Sing That's it. what R.A. Yeah. is dancing to at the wedding. Seven straight road wins. The 12th win in November is the most in any cal- calendar month in team history, and it's only the third time that they swept California since the Ducks came into the league. And uh, What about Biebs whacking back those Bud Lights at the Kings game biz the other night? He the had boys. a nice glaze on, and then his boy Matthew scored. He went and gave the hat and knuckles to every person in the arena. I don't know if you saw him going up and down the aisles with. Moving <laughs> on up. That was such but a they, guarantee but, Matthews was scoring that game with him there, like his buddy there, L.A. Hey, how, how, about on, on, uh, how about on TNT talk, asking about the restaurants, and the, the last one he picked was Tolka Madera. You should see the app. You should see the scene at this place. What is it called? Oh, you've uh, Tolka Madera. They got the, it? oh, it's right in like the it's right in the Viagra Triangle of uh, Old Town Scottsdale. Like, I think you have to take a 20 milligram to go in the place. Like that's like the cover charge. And then they got like the, you know, they every, like the, the table tables with flames on them with those little, uh, like little fireplaces. They got the like restaurant the, turns into a club type thing. Like yeah. The it's like a scene. supper yeah, club. Yeah, they got yeah, the yeah, guy yeah. with the guitar that's hooked up to the sound system I'm going on their Instagram right now. Just, just you know, coming by your table doing riffs. So, uh, yeah, he, he was buzzing. I don't even know how he was dangling so well after, after but by fielding questions like that. So he's a special breed, but it was fun. It was a great question by talk. All right, next up uh, on the Wacky Weekend, we had the glove toss. Uh, Friday, Boston and the Rangers had the Black Friday afternoon game, and uh, near the end of the game, Panarin and Marshawn, you could see them jarring at each other, and all of a sudden, Panarin just chucks his glove at Marshawn. They asked Marshawn after the game. He said, we were just asking about what Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving dinner was. He didn't like what I ate. Uh, Panarin did later confirm that Marshawn's comments were Russia, Putin related. And I guess Marshawn was saying nobody liked them there. And Panarin said, quote, that's why I lost my mind. I lost 5K, but thanks to the old general manager for 11.6 million, I'm good, <laughs> which is absolutely fucking hilarious quote. Uh, the NHL didn't think Marshawn said anything worth disciplining, even if the Rangers did. And I don't know if you guys knew this, but the CBA prevents the league from reviewing mic'd up audio content for any reason related to potential discipline. Uh, that was the only way the NHLPA would agree to have players wear microphones. So, you know, basically you can't get in trouble for what you say. So they couldn't really do anything to, to them anyways. But like how far is too far when you're talking about somebody's country? Like what's, what's the limit? You know what I mean? So they, they could, but you're saying they couldn't use the audio for a racial slur? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm not that I'm sure that was probably maybe a different category, but actually that's a great point uh, with, they said the, the any, only way they'd agree to it, if they couldn't get, if they got assurances, they couldn't get potential discipline. So maybe, now, a racial slur. Yeah. That, that, well, then other we, people would hear it. Yeah, yeah. But maybe they couldn't go to it on that anyways. Well, I, if nobody else heard it, uh, that's, that, that's actually an interesting, interesting question uh, because they're not, let's hope we to, don't but, have any more yeah. of them. Right. Yeah, seriously, but I'm right, just trying ideally. to think like to not be able to use the audio. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I've done a lot of shit talking about how many, Russia, t- how so many I'm times really- in your career wit had, had a guy said something to you that got you that fired up like that, that he, when he went that personal. No, nah, probably never. I mean, guys, you suck, which like bummed me out. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, I was never like 
throwing a glove at him. You know, do you think, do you think Marshawn crossed the line? Do you think that's too personal or do you calling think that's out, something that out as country's president? Not really. Uh, we said, they I mean, obviously support. this kid's been through a lot, right? Like remember he left games last year. He's yeah. been openly like speaking out against Putin. So it's like, it, it, it's t- certainly a different animal for me to judge what would affect him talking about his country is, isn't fair, but I, heard, I, I already said that, that you're a loser. No one likes you. And that's why you didn't get the Putin gold card. That's what I, that's, that's just, I know I haven't heard the audio, but that's just a rumor coming out of the, uh, from between the benches there. What do you think, RA? Yeah, that's, I don't know. I mean, I, I, you can get personal. I think, I think basically if it's not, you're not using racial, racial shit, uh, you know, uh, ethnic stuff. I think, I don't know. We can say whatever, man. It's the NHL. People are I like, know. the, the best players like... in the world. People are going to say nasty stuff. They're going to chirp. And, you know, I know the new generations are, uh, you know, a little, I don't want to say softer, but maybe a little more sensitive about this stuff. But yeah, if it's not something about someone, you know, race or ethnicity or sexual orientation or anything like that, fuck it, man. It should be, you know, whatever. You're making fun of Russia, then say something about fucking his country. Now, mind you, I, I'm i completely fine. And it was hilarious that Panarin threw the glove at him. And if what he said made Panarin so mad that he fought him, which, by the way, Panarin's fought before, he kind of chucks him. Panarin Marchand would actually be a fun fight yeah, to watch. Yeah, it'd be a good fight. Um, so... If it, if it upset him that much, 100%, like, I don't blame him. Do whatever you want. But I just I just am saying, like, I don't think, like, he deserves to be suspended for saying anything about Russia, right? If it pisses him off, I don't blame the kid. But in the end, it's like, do I think it's that bad? No. Okay. It, but is Panarin definitely going to play for Russia in the Olympics if these players actually end up going? Wow. That's yeah, that's a good – I don't know. That's a, it's a great that's question, question. Wit. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, has that even been brought up? I have no idea, but he's been openly speaking out against the country. Putin yeah. is like the die. He's like the super he's on fan the, team. Of the national he, team. Yeah, he's yeah exactly. He's, exactly. Yeah. He's the he's the 13th forward. <laughs> got a snipe. Got a good snipe, too. Uh, during the game, too, uh, Sean McDonough, the announcer, said he talked to Tuka Rask. Uh, Rask told him he'll be skating five times a week beginning next week. He hopes to return to play in January. Hopes it will be as a bro, and I can't imagine he'll go anywhere else. Uh, Almak and Swayman, well, before last night's game, uh, combined 908 save percentage. That's not a number that's going to probably even get you into the playoffs. So a healthy Rask dropping into the Bruins January would be a, a pretty welcome sight for that squad, given given the way the goaltender has been. Although Almak was pretty good last night. You think he's going to definitely be back or what, Whit? I think he would like to be in the way the team's looked. It makes total sense. There's Bruins fans who think that's crazy and don't want him back. Well, You've seen kind of how average your team is this year. It seems like they win one, lose one, same thing, on and on. The goaltending, while at times has been good, overall isn't good enough. So why not bring back one of the best goalies that's ever played for the Bruins? Yeah. That's a fact. And, 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 and Swayman's still on entry level, so you can send him down no waivers. Yep. Yep. So it's exactly. just like it's, you know, all of a sudden, no. what happens to the salary cap? Are they going to be jammed well, up towards Well, you? he would he would have to sign. He'll, he'll He's take UFA, the Buffalo. So he'll probably yeah, do a Buffalo deal. Yeah. Because he's made his money, he said he money's not a concern at this. Oh point. Oh my so. god, fans not wanting him back at seven fifty. Could you imagine that? I don't know uh, if it would actually be seven fifty, well, but yeah. it wouldn't be six million. It would be very low. Like I don't. He won't be playing. He basically said he wouldn't be playing for money. He would just be, you know, playing for the sake. For of the money, impacts so. for the road. That's fucking nice of him. What a guy. Well, for for well, everything he, he's taken in that city, man. As far as the criticism, he's a fucking G. If I'm Ken Hall and I'm hopping on a first class Finnish Airlines flight right over to. Yeah. Well, I guess he's in Boston, but I- I'm just trying to be like, get up to Edmonton, Tuca. Win a Stanley Cup with the Oilers. Once an Oiler, always an Oiler, no matter where you're from. <laughs> uh, all right. The other craziness of the weekend, a helmet toss. We had the glove toss, the fight, and the bite. And now we got uh, two Swedes, too. Uh, Landis Scott, man, he could be a snap show sometimes. Yes, he can. Ekholm was going at it with Randy and just ripped his helmet off and chucked it. Landis Scott comes in and just pummels his countrymen. I mean, these guys have been on the same national teams together. Uh, and then there was a funny clip uh, later in the game. Randon got a hat trick. Did you see that? See that? Someone threw a hat at Landon right in his lap. He, he chucked it on the back of his head, just like a two, three second clip, but absolutely hilarious. Bro. It was it was uh, it was Taves who who put the hat on. Oh, who did I say? I'm sorry. I, I think you said Landis Clark. It doesn't matter. Oh, it was hilarious. He yeah. lands on. He just throws it on backwards quick. It, it, it cuts off. But the abs. Yeah, they're wow. looking. They're and, starting to move now. And like I, I, I knew Kadri was good. That's why you always say if you can get Kadri going, if he could just play hockey and not be an idiot with these hits and these dirty plays that gets him booted out of the playoff series, he's so 
good and such a difference maker. And now I think it's 21 points in the last 10 games or something like that. Uh, rocketing up the, the league leaders in points, and he's phenomenal. And th- th- to do all this without McKinnon shows this team should easily win that division. Going back to Landy, you thought maybe things would calm down with him after he signed the big ticket. Absolutely not. He was going with Hartman uh, in Minnesota in preseason. I would probably say the, the most hardcore captain. I mean, I guess you could maybe throw Brady Kachuk in the mix for how much he likes to get in the mix. But anytime there's a scrum and if he sees one of his teammates being taken advantage of, he does not skip a beat. He gets right over there. And (laughs) I think as soon as Ekholm did that, you could see the regret in his face as as soon as he saw the bull coming over. I don't know how many of you. Oh, shit. Yeah. Cause Landy, you know, Landy can snap, man. But uh, you know, th- that's, that's the reason why he got the deal that he did because he brings it in all facets of the game and uh, definitely, definitely one of the captains you don't, don't want to mess with in the league. And if we're going to talk about the abs a little bit, Kale McCarr, like ever since he's been back, like just the, the way he's been walking the line and the way he's been letting it go, I think he had goals in like, I think there was like four or five games in a row or something like that. And just putting up insane numbers and, Listen, we're still early on for the league awards, so despite a slow start for the Avs, I think Kale McCarr very much in the mix um, um, for the Norris. And I don't know if we were going to get to talking about Ovechkin too, boys. This guy. Were you done with Colorado? um, No, we weren't. Uh, It was great to see Bowen Byron return. Yes. Uh, He's had a lot of injuries. There was a a great article in The Athletic a while back. His first year, it was kind of a nightmare for him, but... Uh, 22 minutes on 25 sh- shifts, four shots on goal, and he scored. So it, it was great to see him back in and get a goal, Biz. Uh, wait, did you get a chance to read that article? Yes, and I yeah. had no clue. Yeah. And and just to read, I had, like, flashbacks of when I – well, luckily it does not seem that that's the case for him. But in the article, it talks about – he's talking – called his mom. He's like, what am I going to do? Like, I, I don't think I can keep playing hockey. Like, I think my career's over. And that, that panic – Oh, God, at that age, too. He's only 20 years old. I feel so bad for the kid. And it talks about what he went through. He went on a 10-day, like, excursion hike trip with his father. They drove 24 hours north of Vancouver, I think. And then ended up taking a plane even, like, deeper into the wilderness and did 10 days. And it really helped him recharge, get his mind right. And then he, he, he got hurt again after that. But just to come back from that one now, just the other night, um, amazing story. And I had no, no idea how difficult the year was. And it makes a lot of sense now, biz, when we were like, why aren't they playing him last year in the playoffs? Yep, like he exactly. was not, he was not in a position to be, to be playing once you read this article. Yeah. And, and they, and they kept it quiet. And I, I actually reached out to uh, Dr. Sigalette, a guy who um, I think he practices in, in, in Burnaby uh, near the eight rinks. And I used to go see him. So he's a neck and head doctor. So me and Gordo would go see him. He worked with Crosby when he was dealing with his concussion issues. I believe that he's also a visitor with Bo Byram. And I was just talking to him about, you know, the process and in, in coming back from one of these. And I was asking him about all the factors and variables because in the article it mentioned how he, he's got a very bubbly personality. And, he, you know, he likes being around the guys and likes being in the mix. And all of a sudden, because of the COVID protocol, he really wasn't able to interact with, one, his new teammates – um, you know, you know, it was kind of go to the rink and go home and don't really have much fun. He couldn't really go anywhere out in public. At one point, his mom came down to visit him. But I was when I was talking to him, I said, how much does uh, does depression play a factor in your recovery process? And he goes, when dealing with these concussions, there's so many variables involved. They can all have an impact, including like, you know, something like that. Like, you know, the, the depression, it has to do sometimes with, with the neck itself, of course, the swelling of the head. So just reading that article, it gave you like a better understanding what someone's going through when dealing with the symptoms of a concussion. And it sucks that the guy, as you said, Whit, had to deal with it so early in his career, but it seems as if though, you know, he's going to be back in the lineup and back ready to go. So uh, definitely a, a, a young prospect. You, you can't lose to these types of things. That That is the best defense in the NHL. Yeah. The, 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 the Taves himself, Makar, uh, Gerard looks great. Eric Johnson's Johnson. played in the league a long time. Jack Johnson's there is like the five, six, seven. They got prospects. Of, it's just it's a it's a an unreal team. And on defense, they got guys who can defend and move the puck and do both. Scary. Yeah. Boys, we were so amped up to start, we forgot to mention our guest who we're going to bring on in a little while. Brad Marsh, uh, longtime Philadelphia defenseman. He's the coach of the Philadelphia Warriors uh, disabled military team that we went down to Philadelphia to watch and visit with. So great interview coming up in a little bit. Just wanted to mention that. Also want to mention cross-country mortgage. Much like us at Bostool, a people-first group of people. 
They're dedicated to the fundamentals of mortgage lending, which results in a fast, convenient, and less stressful home financing or refinancing experience. And right now, rates are unbelievably low. Don't pay the bank more money than you need to because cross-country mortgage makes the process as painless and simple as possible and helps keep your money in your pocket so you can do fun things with it, like trips to Vegas or a new HD TV. And the folks at Cross Country are great people, easy to work with, and they can simplify things if you're not familiar with the stuff. It can get overwhelming, man, very overwhelming. So if you're a homeowner and you haven't refied lately, you could be leaving thousands or even tens of thousands on the table. And that's money that could go towards some holiday gifts, maybe a nice little spit and chicklets gear, or just some pocket cash for whatever. Rates are at an all-time low and may never get this low again. So call today for a fast, free, great quote and a free home valuation. And when you do, tell them Bostool sent you. Go to crosscountrymortgage.com slash Bostool to learn more about your future home buying experience or to refinance your current mortgage. Cross Country Mortgage, LLC, NMLS 3029, all on subjects to underwriting approval, www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. Uh, a couple other news. Uh, you already mentioned that Ottawa waived Matt Murray. Uh, the Sens brought him in a few years ago to help turn the team around, but he just never resembled the guy who helped Pittsburgh win back-to-back cups. Uh, they assigned him to AHL Belleville. He's the sixth highest paid goalie in the league. He's got two years left at six and a quarter million. He's still only 27 years old. Um, nobody claimed him. Man. I thought Buffalo might have put a claim in for him, given that they've had a kind of a carousel of goaltenders, but it didn't happen. I wasn't really surprised he didn't get claimed. It's been a real tough go for him. We actually talked about when even when he was in Pittsburgh, the ability for him to stay healthy because he seemed to get hurt. He's He's not a big guy, right? He's a skinny guy, doesn't weigh a lot, so he's had trouble staying healthy. I know he had COVID this year. His whole outlook is that uh, they kind of threw him under the bus. Like, I guess he, like, obviously, it, it goes without saying, this guy's furious, right? He's in the minors now. He's a top-paid goalie in the league. He's a two-time Stanley Cup champion. So he kind of blames, like, I don't know, maybe maybe the team that they put out there and that it's not all on him, but when you look at the numbers two years in a row, or they're, they're, they're tough. And that team needs goaltending. They need to be able to get timely saves to at least stay in games when their roster's overmatched. So you got a guy who's furious and pissed off and embarrassed, which is the, the toughest part about it. Um, when I went to the minors, it was, it was it's the worst feeling, right? He's, when you've been in the NHL a while, let alone winning Stanley Cup, yeah. and signing this big ticket. Like I went down when I was, wasn't was a great player anymore and I was making a million dollars. So for him, it's just such a kick to the – I know ego sounds wrong, but it, it's true. It's like you think of yourself as a player and what you can do, and now you're not even in the NHL anymore. So best thing he could do is just go down and try to like have fun with the game again and enjoy the game like a lot of guys have talked about, and maybe he ends up getting picked up. Because if he went to light up the AHL this year – there's someone coming deadline time that would look as long as Ottawa would c- c- retain some of the salary. I, I mean, I've seen it done before. I mentioned Peter Buda. I mentioned uh, Jack Campbell. Mind you, like you mentioned the two Stanley Cups, right? It's a little, a little bit tough. And I think that everybody had a level of optimism when he signed with, with Ottawa that, hey, listen, this guy's going to be able to find his game back. This team is in the basement, but they're starting to draft well. And, you know, they're, they're going to start picking up some assets and you think that he's going to probably see 40 shots a game. And once you're seeing all that rubber, you're going to be able to find your game back. And you said it where it just really hasn't looked good in the, in, in the short time that he's been there. And I'm, I'm, I was surprised to see him go on waivers and then not be claimed, but um, you said it, go down there, completely change the mind frame and hopefully you can find your game back because it's, you know, it's been done before by other guys and uh, that's really the only approach you can take. Uh, the Sens also claimed Adam Gaudet off of waivers from Chicago. Uh, and the other big waving, uh, San Jose waved to Van Kane, a uh, $7 million forward. He's going to play for the Barracuda per his agent as they seek a deal elsewhere. The Sharks are willing to eat some of that money. He's got three more years left at 7 million after this season. His teammates didn't want him back. I think that was pretty well established. Uh, you know, I, know I wonder, does putting him in the AHL, like, you know, you got all I these think, young, uh, young kids. Is that going to poison that I think that this well is when uh, Akalini goes full Jerry Jones. Because I know there's some rumblings out oh. there that he might up, end up in Vancouver. Yeah. That's where he's from. I mean, at this point, you might as well try anything you can with. How many more years does Kane have, R.A.? Three more years after this season at seven <sighs> though, per. So... The fact that when he plays and he's out of the, the bullshit all, away from the rink, he's nasty. He's a legit power forward, 30-goal guy. Yeah, Vancouver would love him. But I don't know. Like, 
That's a lot to take in on a team that's in disarray right now. Vancouver, they're not doing anything. They're just like, I don't, I don't, when does the, sh- if they play Montreal tonight, they blew another game last night, Sunday night against the Bruins. If they lose again, at what point does something happen? If you're saying that what happens with Vancouver is not a GM being got let go or Travis Green or a big trade, it's bringing in a Vander well, Kane. I'm asking the, the city of Vancouver would have <laughs> another round of riots ripped up. Well, they're not doing anything. If they lose against the Habs and back to back after giving up the lead against Boston, I mean, we're going to have to wait for it and this pot will be out after the fact. But I mean, I don't think Travis Green should go. I think people are more so waiting on Benning to get gassed and or and or a trade or some type of move. You almost like it's gotten to the point where it's so comical. You almost have to pick up Evander Kane in order to get the, get, get the team in the mix again. Right. So I don't, I don't know. know. I, I don't know what the answer is. I keep saying like, oh, I, I think I've got two different group texts going. If they lose the next one, something's happening. If they lose the next one, something's happening. If it doesn't happen after the Montreal game, if they lose, they then lose the what a toilet bowl game. Tonight. We got them playing oh the violin as the ship's going down on the fucking Titanic. If they're doing it the whole season long. I think, the, I think my, my guess would be that the way that Evander Kane gets back to the NHL is by going down to the AHL and having absolutely zero rumblings of him not being 100% a team guy and playing well and just keeping his mouth shut and playing hockey, right? Stay out of any bullshit and just play good hockey and be a good team guy, and at some point he'd be back in the league. But until that happens and that's proven with what the, his own teammates in San Jose said to the GM this summer, how are you going to bring him in, dude? Yeah, I don't think we're going to see him back on the, on the Sharks roster. I think you're pretty No, I'm saying any there. roster right yeah. now. I mean, who, that's what I'm saying. Who's, who's going to trade for this guy with his track record? He's going to really have to He's going to fight the trainer when he lets him know that he, he's got to put his money in a cup to buy a soggy sub for after the game. He won't even, <laughs> la- he won't even last one roadie with. Uh, speaking of the Canucks, oh. it was pretty nice to see Connor Gallon get a goal in front of his parents Sunday night. Wit, huh? I know he yeah, actually won. Cool. He got the- I, I bet the Bruins in regulation. I won, so I was happy at the time. I was, I was motherfucking him, but that's great job, Connor. <laughs> <laughs> he's been hey, he's been lighting the lamp. He's probably been one of their most consistent guys up front. Yeah, absolutely, by far and away. And there's not many of them there. Him and Miller. You did mention Miller. Um, Ari, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, uh, Thomas Drance, he's a, he covers the, the Vancouver Canucks. He, yep. he mentioned that there was a little bit of tension in practice with the fact that Miller yelled down from one end to Travis Green, like, nobody knows what the fuck we're doing over here in this drill down the ice. Obviously, with the way that things are going, this isn't that uncommon. Like, sometimes there's just a little bit of confusion. Like, listen, if, some, if the coach goes to the board and writes down three drills, there's a chance that I'm not remembering the first drill that he wrote down. There's definitely a chance I'm not remembering the last drill he wrote down. And that's a big reason why I used to go last in line. So sometimes there's just a little bit of miscommunication. This kind of went viral and then people were, oh, lack of leadership, this and that. And then it created a little bit more of a, 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 an issue. What's up, G? I was going to say there were some rumors uh, going around the internet right now, because we are the rumor boys, that uh, JT Miller could be in a potential trade to Boston. Because Boston Ooh. needs some center help up the middle. <laughs> That would, that would, I don't know what Boston would have to give up. That would be a nice deal for Boston. Two, two Karras rights. Jack stuck Nikia. And a lot more. I, I, JT Miller, that guy's fucking nice player. That's 20, 30 goal guy. You can't just be chucking snud Nika in the mix. I, I, I don't know. The Canucks, the one thing I'll say about being on a losing team and in Canada, nonetheless, is every single day is stressful and, when you're losing, it's like everyone is w- walking on their tippy toes and, and you're, you're wondering, am I the one that's going to be going here? Like, who, what's going to happen? There's a feeling of very uneasiness that goes around with every single guy and the trainers and the coaching staff. So when tempers flare in practice, when you're in, on a team that's losing every game, like that is not at all a shocker because everyone's fucking panicking inside their own mind the entire time to begin with. Yeah, we're, we're a, a loss against Montreal and one little puck battle gone wrong in practice to having a full, full, full-fledged full Donnie Brook in the Vancouver Canucks. The media hops on the ice, like everyone's squaring off. Just full-fledged, like- lower the fucking cage. Let's go here. Drance in the mix, everybody. and All the analytics guys, 
the people from the riot, they're bringing them back from uh, Surrey or wherever, whatever <laughs> bridge and tunnel they came through. That couple that was making out in that picture. If I can get oh, them. actually, <laughs> all right, uh, guys, I'm going to completely switch this to serious topic. There's been a lot of storms and floods in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Ryan Reynolds ended up sending out a tweet. I got my buddy Bradley Friesen, who I ended up doing the ice bucket challenge with, who has a helicopter, and he's been running out supplies to wherever he can. Check him out on Instagram, on social media. That's Bradley Friesen. He's got links in his bio. Anything you can do to help, guys. This is very sad. People, there's been deaths. People are losing their farms, their land. Uh, you know, they're stuck because roads have been closed. So it just, it, it really sucks. So I just wanted to mention that. Uh, and, you know, BC is such a beautiful place. I have a lot of friends there and and, and they're really struggling right now. So we're, we're thinking of you guys and, and do what you can to help, as I mentioned. Well said, Biz. Well said. Uh, we have another note out of San Jose as well. Uh, General Manager Doug Wilson has taken a temporary medical leave from his day-to-day -day activities. I guess he's had this persistent cough for a while now. They can't figure out what's causing it. It's not COVID-related. It's just some sort of crazy cough he can't get rid of. Uh, so Assistant GM Joe Will is going to take over for him in the meantime. So obviously we wish Doug Wilson the best. We want to see him get well and get back out there and uh, hopefully he comes back healthy. Um, Speaking of health, the Islanders finally got a reprieve from the league. The league finally postponed some games for this team after having seven plays in protocol, and they kept losing and losing. Uh, the scheduled games versus the Rangers Sunday and Philadelphia Tuesday will be played at a later time. Uh, the practice facility will be closed uh, through at least Monday. If the players and staff test negative three straight days, New York could resume practice Wednesday. They're scheduled to play Thursday at home versus San Jose. Like I said, they lost eight straight. Uh, the second team to postpone games after the Sens did earlier. And then this just came over Twitter a few minutes ago. The Canes said that uh, Tony D'Angelo and Brett Pesci have entered the COVID protocols as well. So hopefully this, you know, we said at yeah. the season, this just doesn't keep going on and on and on, but uh, that's what's going oh, now on. The, yeah. Omi, the Omicron variants coming though. Whit, you know what I'm going to compare the, uh, the Islanders start to the season so far with is last year's Dallas stars. You know, they, they dealt with some injuries. They got off to a slow start. All of a sudden they got COVID. They had games move. Now they're going to be, you know, their, their schedule is going to be condensed. So I don't know. I, I'm glad that they actually canceled some, some games for them. I know sometimes we joke around about the, you know, the Islanders and, and, and their, you know, how boring they are to play and blah, blah, blah. But the league needed to step in and do something for this squad. Yeah, it becomes yeah. not fair. Uh, okay, before we send it over to Brad Mash, one last thing. We want to congratulate Mark Edward Vlasic on playing in his 1100th NHL game. Quite an accomplishment. You guys must have went to head-to-head -to -head with this guy. One of the pro probably more un unheralded defensemen of his era. I think one of the quickest guys to get the 400 games. Always healthy, always reliable. Played for Team Canada. Pro uh, uh, very compar car comparable to like a Nicholas Jarmelson. Just a really, really good shutdown defenseman. Can you know, play with anyone and uh, an unbelievable career wit. Yeah, I actually think when I when I think of their careers, I would say Vlasic is, is like a better player, better career than Yarmulsen. I don't know if he was as good at blocking shots, but just overall could do more. Um, yeah, when you look back at like Canadian Olympic gold medalists in men's hockey, like that's not a name that jumps to your your head right away. But the re the reason he's on that team is because he quietly and like. What's the word? Subtly? Subtly. So, there's a B in the word, right? Yeah, but it's silent. Really? It's subtle. Yeah. Yeah. So subtle. at least I knew something there subtly goes about being excellent, right? Where he doesn't do anything that amazing. He just doesn't make any mistakes. And every time he gets the puck, he'll make the 10, 15 foot pass that's perfect and right there and always has good gap, plays great defensively. So I know his games struggle a little bit. And part of the problem in San Jose, even though they're fighting for the playoffs right now, they're doing way, way more than I expected them to this year. But part of the problem is that he's signed, making a lot of money that he deserved, but you're getting the, you're getting the tail end of his career. And I think he's played better this year, but to get to 1100 that fast at that age is nuts. One of the all time great nicknames as well. Pickles is the yeah. classic pickles. I'm not a pickles guy. Are you? Oh, I love a fucking dill pickle, sour pickle. Oh, love pickles. I really, like the you butter just, you ones. Grab them out of, you grab pickles. them out of the jar in the in the fridge and just crush them right there. Fucking six, eight of them. And Ra's the, the one who goes to the six convenience to eight store. Uh, That's the best he's getting, the pickle he's I ever had. Pickles or not the deviled pickles, the the deviled eggs too. Oh, the, no, 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 you ain't gonna catch me eating those bad boys. You know, you know when you go to like the 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 town, like the <laughs> men's hall, bar. Town, yeah, and they got <laughs> the big jar of eggs. Oh, yeah. nasty, no. 
not me, not on those. But all right, boys, uh, I think it's time to send it over to Brad Mash. This is, yeah. this is a great interview. Um, but first, we want to let you know this interview is brought to you by Sport Clips. I don't take my broken phone screen to a mechanic for the same reason I don't trust my hair in the hands of my grandma stylist. I want someone who specializes in me and the experts at Sport Clips are trained specifically for guys' hair. Long, curly, short, thinning, that's me, thick, chubby face, skinny, whatever you look, they know how to cut and shape your hair to fit you best. Afterwards, you may even get a pinch on the cheek from grandma. Sport Clips, the pros in men's hair. And now, enjoy Brad Marsh. Well, our next guest was one of the best stay-at-home defensemen in the 1980s and the heart and soul of the Philadelphia Flyers of that era. He was taken 11th overall in the 1978 draft by the Atlanta Flames and went on to play over 1,100 NHL games, including playoffs. These days, he coaches the Philadelphia Warriors, a team made up of disabled military veterans, and the reason we are in town this weekend, Philadelphia. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast, Brad Marsh. Thanks for joining us, Mashi. Hey, happy to be here. I love being introduced as a stay-at-home defenseman because that means he could not score. It's <laughs> <laughs> a nice way of saying it. That's he just right. did his job on his own end. Yeah, yeah, very polite. Very yeah, absolutely. Polite. A little tire pump there as well. Yeah, I enjoyed yeah. watching you play. I always like those stay-at-home guys. So, obviously, I just mentioned we're here for the Philadelphia Warriors, a team made up of disabled veterans. How did you become involved with this? How did you become their coach? Well, I'll tell you, it started with December 2nd, 2018 with a Learn to Skate program for veterans. And uh, we put it on through the Flyers, of course. And uh, uh, myself and Rob Bear, who worked together within Flyerland, as I refer to her, both in the community development department, uh, we had this Learn to Skate. And um, 38 veterans showed up. And, you know, we had some nice swag for them. And then from there, we had a practice at the Wells Fargo Center. And from there... Uh, the program just kept growing and growing. And one of the biggest things that really helped it along was every time there's an outdoor game, and I didn't know this, uh, the NHL and the host team, they have a legacy grant. And uh, so uh, within Flyer Land, they said, come up with some ideas what we could do with the legacy grant. And, of course, Rob and I uh, were pushing for let's start a Flyers Warriors team for disabled veterans. And so a lot of good suggestions around the table and so on, but – Flyers, Warriors, the veterans won out. So we got $50,000, and the first thing we did, we bought a year's worth of ice and uniforms, which was really cool. And uh, so anyhow, the guys were introduced at the outdoor game. We had a really nice uh, ceremony or reception right in the Flyers dressing room, and we talked about, and you guys know how important the dressing room is, and we talked about them being now a part of the Flyers organization, and we're proud to have them as part of our on our team. And it was really cool. We had jerseys for them. And, and from there, the program has just taken off it's been incredible and a lot of fun that's an amazing story just to just to hear how it began and you were telling me before about how many guys are into it and how many people who showed up to the learn to skate so now at this point are there tryouts for the team right you got a lot of guys looking to play right oh, no, do you, you got to snip guys yeah, all of a sudden yeah. it's like hey bud you got to work on your shot next next summer yeah. Yeah. down to the AHL of, uh, <laughs> that's right yeah well you know what is it's, it's uh, we have three full teams now okay nice uh, so like I said we had to learn to skate and so we have some good players and we have some players that think they're really good you know it doesn't matter that's your job they, though Hey, you gotta Whatever. calm down your voice. Yeah, and they keep saying, uh, we need to be evaluated. We need to be evaluated. So we finally evaluated, and they didn't like the valuations for heaven's <laughs> sakes. But uh, we have three t- three teams based on uh, based on uh, ability, okay. tier one, two, and three. And uh, so, uh, hey, like I said a couple times already, and I'll say it many more times, it's great. They're a great group of guys, and uh, I'm just happy to be associated with them. And then, you know, after they got the $50,000 grant, they said, okay, who's going to run or who's going to, you know, do the program? And I put my hand up and says, well, I'll coach them. And, uh, and then so right from the get-go, uh, I've been involved with the day-to-day operations of it, if, if you will. But as I tell the guys, this program would not be successful if, if, if it wasn't for the effort and the time that the Warrior players put into it. They, they've been awesome. And we're at the Warrior Classic this weekend. We're setting up today. We had 25 guys there. Uh, work and we had their wives there they're all get everybody's chipping in to do their part to make this tournament successful i i think that us three us four have all always said like it's it's 
kind of been our goal to get involved, at least in, in an ability to help people. And like you're so dialed in with these guys and what these guys have sacrificed and gone through that it's amazing to see them find some some peace and happiness, right, with just getting their mind off what they deal with regularly. You talked about post-traumatic stress and things like that. They get to be on the ice. So the ability, I think, for you to watch them really get competitive and care and just basically forget about some of the issues they battle every day must mean so much to you. Yeah, you know, we have some guys this weekend will be their very first hockey game. Oh, really? Yeah, and it's it, it's great. They come, they don't know how to skate, and uh, they work their butt off, and it's just it's just wonderful to see them improve over the the years. We practice yeah. every week, every week, even during the summertime. It's a beautiful, ninety five degrees out. We got the in Atlantic City and the shore, forty five minutes away. We'll have 50 guys at practice. Without a doubt, it's great. And it's expanded to different cities now because you guys have kind of created this like like a business model in order to help other areas and different cities grow and create their own teams and, and eventually travel and meet up and play against yeah, each other. Yeah, there's 38 teams, 38 warrior programs throughout the U.S. And some of those uh, centers, like St. Louis, is tremendous. We, we were really instrumental in helping them start their program. They have four teams. How many um, NHL teams, have, like the Flyers and the Blues, how many other teams? Or is it just random? It's just kind of random. Okay. Uh, the, 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 the Blues are, are big supporters, as is the Blues alumni. And uh, because they kind of followed our, our model, the Flyers nice. are 100% behind the, the Warriors, the alumni. Uh, we're, we're all over it. We, uh, we support them uh, through coming to practice and so on, but we also support them financially in a big way. And so St. Louis followed our, our model, and it's been wonderful. But it would be my hope as this program continues to grow and grow and grow that each NHL team would adopt uh, or adapt uh, this model that that, that works yeah. and embrace a warrior team so there can be, uh, you know, um, a Phoenix team. We talked about that on the phone the other day yeah. when we introduced ourselves. That You know, there could be an L.A. team. And so you just right across the, the U.S. And uh, so that would be my long-term vision of this uh, this whole warrior program. Just one more answer that we need is the why. It's, it's like, you talked about the, the locker room environment and, you know, what they experienced going overseas or wherever they had to go in order to fight for their country. Why is it so important to create this environment for them? Well, they're, they're missing a lot. And, you know, you guys talked to other players and you guys went through it. What do you miss? What do you miss? The, the dressing room. The yeah. dressing room, the guys, the dressing room. The, the dressing room's a powerful, powerful thing. And we've used the dressing room to, to bring these guys together. None of them knew each other. It's not like they were best buddies. And, hey, let's go join a hockey team. Uh, you know, they, they, they came uh, to the team. They walked in the dressing room. I refer to it as your first day of school. Or, or when you get traded and you walk into that dressing room, the, the, you know, for the first time, it, it's nerve-wracking and so these guys all walked into the dressing room the first time and now they're best buddies they're their wives we have a, a, a i don't want to call it a wives club because that kind of sounds cheesy but the wives get together just like the players get together and uh, so you know when they get out of the military and they go live in suburbia wherever that may be they're not going to talk to their neighbor about what they just experienced exactly. and now with the dress room now they have like-minded people to share their experiences with share their problems with their troubles with and then, as I like to tell people, that the dress room then flows over into the parking lot because we have tailgate parties all the oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we have a tailgate. The barbecues are set up. The tents are set up. The games are set up. Play pens because the kids are all there to run around. We have daycare. We have daycare at every one of our practices. So nobody has to miss practice because, uh, because we have a lot of single parents and nobody has to miss practice. Or they bring their kids to practice so mom or dad can have some time alone in the house. So it's great. Yeah, kind of like the NHL, an excuse to go out and grab drinks with the guys, right? <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and, and, you, and you did mention the, the, the wives aspect. It's also for them to be able to communicate, communicate together because of what they're going through when their husbands come back over. And, you know, it, you know it's, a, there's, it's different, right? Yeah. For them, even them to communicate to other, other, other women out there who haven't experienced that, there's, they're not like-minded, like you said. Yeah, because most people don't wake up in the middle of the night with a nightmare or the terrors. Or, and I've heard a lot of the stories, and you just shake your head. And so now, like you just said, the wives have somebody in common that they can share stories with. And so the program, and I, I like to say we're, we're improving lives of not just the players that are part of the Warriors, but we're improving lives of the whole family unit through the sport of hockey. And it's been so much fun. And uh, I look forward to going to every practice. And I skate the crap out of them. 
him too. It's awesome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I, know, I know you're giving yeah, it to yeah. him. I bring there. out my Mike Keenan, Bob Kelly, who comes <laughs> oh, out, out to the practice. He busts my chop all the time. And uh, Mike Keenan's back. Mike Keenan's back. But anyhow, they, they love it. They love it. They just eat it all up. That would be the only practice where like half the guys don't show up. Uh, yeah. Normally, every, yeah. Guy, every guy wants the ice time. They're like, oh, Keenan's coming. No, we're yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> what, what kind of mood's Brad in today? Yeah. yeah but uh, oh, Awesome. Given that they wear the Flyers logo, there must be some fights. No? Well, <laughs> um, it's interesting because, you know, all these guys have a minimum of a 10% disability. Some have more. Um, but we're all standing disabled, mm-hmm. and so there's no limbs. It's not sled hockey. And so, unfortunately, most of their disability is from the shoulders okay. up. So there's a lot of switches there yeah. that go off. The referee's yeah. bad, just like in, in any hockey. Yeah, they're telling me bad yeah. calls. They're losing. Oh, really? oh, guys, God. guys, hold on yeah. here, boys. <laughs> yeah, the first tournament we went to. So we, we got together in 218, our first practice, then we had the big press conference where we welcomed the team. And, you know, it was really cool. We we worked through this we skated through the summer and then then we had a training camp and i had it set up just like an nhl training camp chuck fletcher and the flyers were great we mimicked everything they did i even had my buddies come in and do fit testing with the bikes and they you know oh, blood no. work and all that like VO2. Oh, it was, oh, it was awesome it was, yeah it was awesome and and the, the best part about the training camp was uh uh the flyers trainers washed their underwear like some of their underwear has been in their bag for a year for heaven's yeah. sakes and, and they got to the royal treatment and then the flyers we had our very first exhibition game before the flyers first exhibition game of that season so it was really cool we were playing on the flyers ice and we played uh uh played a, uh, a team from washington and we won and then we set up another game and we won that game so everything was going pretty good we go to vegas uh, for the Warrior Classic, which we're hosting this weekend. And we get behind 2 nothing in the first game, and then a little chirping starts on the bench, and I'm like, oh, geez, like, what's going on here? And then the referee just started calling every damn penalty in the book, and our guys flipped. Like, they were yelling at each other, yelling at the referee, yelling at me, but this, the switch went off. It was unbelievable. <laughs> called timeout, timeout. Okay, what the hell's going on here, boys? I don't recognize anything here. So anyhow, we calmed down. We won the game, and we spent the weekend, and we still continue to talk about it is, is controlling our temper on the ice and because we're here to play hockey. And as you guys know, I've never once seen a referee change his mind. No. You, you know. Oh, you Kerry know. Frazier does a little oh, bit. Oh, yeah. 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 Toronto does <laughs> that on the pot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyhow, and then I might must add, too, we won the championship, too. So it was cool. At that first tournament? Yeah, the first tournament, we won the championship in, in our tier. So we were in, uh, I think, tier three. But anyway, we won Not the championship. Not a bad city to win yeah. it in, either. Yeah, well, we had a good time. We went into a bar. <laughs> Forget we're like Batman. We're gonna need more than that 50k budget. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We go into that. We're that ball service was what? Shit. (laughs) We're in the Hard Rock, uh, the hotel there in Vegas, and uh, we're in one of their bars, and they have this thing that kind of looks like a Stanley Cup. And we ask, can you take that down? And why? And so they take it down. And then the, the bartender says, it hasn't been down in 25 years. They're dust and dirty in it. We just. Blew the dust out. We filled it up with beer, and we were all drinking out of it. Oh, my goodness gracious. What a time. We oh had a great goodness. time. Yeah, yeah. We actually had the pleasure to meet one of your players a few years back, uh, Devin Riccio. Yeah. Philadelphia Jake. Yeah. Great guy. I've had yeah. a friendship with him since. So. Yeah. Is, great guy. Is he, is he one of your uh, captains, I think? Well, yeah. He's, he's one of our captains this year. Fight, he's a firefighter in town here. Great guy. Yeah. Great guy. He's a sharpshooter in the military. Can't hit the damn net, though. <laughs> <laughs> It's unbelievable. I said, Richie, what the hell are you doing out there? Like, hit the net, buddy. <laughs> That's I tried to give him a shout. He got sued. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Well, we talked about you want to get him into his Well, career? I was just going to say, yeah, oh, it's, it's amazing that you're keeping yourself busy in your post career. One of the reasons why we wanted to get you on over a thousand games. Um, surprisingly, you didn't get your silver stick at the time, though. And that ended oh. up having, happening years later. So we wanted to get you on to talk about your entire career. Uh, a lot of fascinating things. So I guess I'll let R.A. kick it all off. I mean, we always thought at the beginning, and I, you know, I look at your hockey DB, the London Knights. They weren't even the OHL yet; it was still the OHA. How crazy were nineteen seventies juniors game in Canada? He still made more money playing for that team. Than he did <laughs> oh, stop! <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, the Hunters weren't the coaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I. Uh, well, back in those days, uh, uh, Howard Darwin owned the London Knights, but he also owned the Ottawa Sixty Sevens. And we were two rivals, and both places were packed all the time. We played in the finals the one time, and. 
And he uh, must have wanted one of the teams to do say, better than the other, right? Uh, I don't know what good? it was, but I remember playing, and uh, we were making a push to be in, in the, to finish strong playoffs and all that. We got two dollars a hit, two dollars a body check, and they'd pay right after the game with two dollar bill. I can't they don't have it anymore? Come they have on. The and so after the game, he'd give out the two dollar bill to <laughs> how many hits. Man, we were an aggressive team. Even the, oh, even the chicken. That's guys. how you became a home a stay at home defenseman. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, would have had to pay the coach. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> now it was uh, it was uh, it was pretty uh, pretty wild times. Play. Uh, I'm from London, Ontario, so back in those days, each junior team could protect the six players within their region. Oh, really? And yeah. so you know, the one year they protected was myself, Rob Bramage, uh, Patty Riggin. Um, and uh, we had a, we had a good squad there in London. We never uh, never won the you know the championships. Uh, Ottawa beat us for heaven's sake. So, and uh, but it was good. So it was really neat playing in front of my hometown. But London, nice, great logo. What a historic crests in junior hockey. I, I was going to ask, what was the the most you made in one game from hits? Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> Doubled any double digit yeah, nights. Yeah, and then uh, we used to stop at McDonald's after on a road trip for the game, and you'd come off, and Bill Long was the coach. I don't know if you know Bill Long, but he was ninety five years old when he coached us. Like he was ancient. <laughs> he was ancient, and he'd sit up at the front, and we'd all get a two dollar bill. Two dollar bills were big back in junior, and we'd walk off and he'd give us a two dollar bill, and you'd go in, you get your, you get the Big Mac. F- small fries and a and a soda for the two bucks, and he just said, <laughs> it "Just handing them to you as you yeah, guys walk yeah, off." Yeah, but I haven't had a Big Mac since, for heaven's sakes. And and never spent time in the AHL. Did you ever play in the minors? No, at all, I was fortunate. I was drafted by the Atlanta Flames, and uh, you know they were in need of defensemen at yeah. the time, so I went right from junior. And it was a twenty-year-old draft back then. Really? And so you were a young man when you got drafted at twenty, and. And sometimes, I, I, I mean, I know they're 18 and, you know, legally they got to be drafted. But if you look at the draft years when it was a 20-year-old draft, the vast majority of first-round picks played. Oh, that Whereas two years was no big. missing. Yeah, yep. yeah. That, that, that two, years two extra year develop, uh, yeah. development to and, watch and, them, and they end up coming into the players that they thought they were yeah. going to be. Yeah, and, you know, now you're drafting a kid at 18, and, you know, you look through the draft rosters, and there's more players do not make it than make it. So um, uh, Quickly going back to the OHA, how many teams were in the league back then? Were you seeing a lot of the same guys usually? Yeah, I can't remember. I'd have to really think about it. But, uh, you know, our longest road trip was up to Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie, uh, which was a great uh, – the old, the old Sault Ste. Marie. You go to Sudbury and they uh, they have a wolf, St. Sudbury Wolves. They still had it when I was playing. Oh, really? And the wolf would go across when the they top. That, yeah, yeah. Wait, this, wait, what do you mean? They had like a, a taxidermied wolf. <laughs> yeah. And it was in one of the corners and there was a zip line that would go to the middle of the rink. <laughs> yeah. And when they would score, they'd have like the wolf noise and this thing would yeah. like <laughs> rusty on the rusty yeah. track line yeah. all the way out. Oh, oh, oh. Get it for the coyotes, biz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, but uh, and then in Sault Ste. Marie, because I played that old building too. Yeah, but they've yeah. gotten a new one now. Yeah. But it, it almost looked like it like slanted in. I don't know yeah. if that was a construction it error, was sinking. I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but anyway, that was our longest road trip, and uh, we we had a lot of fun on on the road trips there back in junior and. Uh, um, it, we had a good team. We had a really good team in London. You, you talked about your coach. Was Brian Kilray by chance the yeah, coach? Yeah, he was coaching in Ottawa. Yeah, another legendary coach. That, he was there that long. That, he, yeah. he was a young buck then, I guess, yeah. when, when he was coaching at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. He's a good guy, too. He's, he's still still alive, luckily, and thankfully, but he's a good guy. A lot of players love playing for Brian. What was it like being coached by a 95-year-old? Well, like, I was in jest. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know how he – He's only you know, 91. Yeah, so you know, I, I started playing junior at 14, and you come in, and then it's like your great-grandpa's coaching <laughs> the team, for heaven's sakes. But – Bill Long put a lot of players in the NHL. Yeah, put a lot of players. Oh yeah, in I'm the not NHL. taking that away. Yeah. I just think at a certain. But it point, was you're... it was funny. I remember. Um, so I I played junior. See in London, um, uh, Howard owned the the uh, the Squires, London Squires, same crest. They were the junior B team. Then the London Knights it was the junior A team, same crest. And then the the London uh, Kings, which was the senior team. Back in the days, senior hockey would pack the building just as much as junior hockey was. It was unbelievably. And good what are hockey. all those guys just not like? What senior hockey? They're I think not it was pros, guys right? who finished or... playing pro and they just came back home and it was still very competitive and they had le- they had. They the... still have. Senior your league like yeah. yeah yeah i don't think they 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 used to get paid pretty decent back yeah then. well back oh. in the day when it was a six team league 
uh, the senior hockey loop was very strong because a lot of players uh, opted not to play in the NHL because they would play for a senior team in London and they'd have an unbelievable job in London yeah. and then also play for the double London. Double dipping. Yeah, double dipping. And uh, my junior B coach, Ted Power was his name, and he was a tough son of a gun. But I remember reading about him that he was deemed at the time the best player outside of the NHL, but he chose not to play in the NHL because he got a job with uh, with London Hydro and – you know, over the years, he ended up being the president of London Hydro, and it worked out good for him. Yeah, it it just goes to show where salaries were at in the NHL at that time, yes, too, right? Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, you ended up getting drafted. Uh, he mentioned by Atlanta. Um, what like what was your signing bonus like? Like, what was that whole? Experience? I made fifty five thousand dollars my my first year as a first round pick, eleventh overall, fifty five thousand. And hey, I thought I was on cloud nine, oh, and yeah. you've heard that before. I mean, but that's what the salaries were back then. And it went fifty five, seventy five, eighty five in my, my first three years. And uh, but you know, going from a hockey hotbed of London, Canada, and going to Atlanta when you know, Friday night football outdrew us and so on and saw us. It was quite an eye-opener. That's what I was going to ask. I mean, hockey couldn't stick there this century. So what was it like 40 years ago? I mean, it must have been foreign to those people. Well, the, the, the misconception, we had good fans. Um, was there enough of them? I'm not sure. But we never won in Atlanta. We had good teams. Yeah. And especially for an expansion team. But, you know, we finished, you know, fifth, sixth overall in the league in 78, my first year. And uh, But they never won a playoff round. And it doesn't matter what sport you you're playing. That. If you don't win, you're not going to win over that fringe crowd. And so uh, Nelson Scalbania walked into the owner's office in 1980. We lost to the Rangers. He said, I want to buy your team. And, no, oh, it's not for sale. Well, yes, it is. And so he bought it. <laughs> Everything for, is. Yeah, he bought it for $16 million back then. And back then and we moved to calgary so wow. uh well, so you must have been kind of fired up at that point though right yeah i was to canada get some yeah, fans and- yeah it was pretty cool we were we were the the toast of the town as you could imagine the calgary stampede we were the oh. honorary i go up there to the the stampede they give me a horse i'm riding around calgary <laughs> in, a, in a horse like johnny goudreau yeah, and the yeah, gucci yeah, the gucci yeah, loafers yeah and I had cowboy boots on, though. Good for you. Yeah, Johnny yeah. wore Gucci high top. <laughs> yeah. No, I thought he yeah. had – didn't he have the Yeezys, yeah. he had the Kanye West shoes on, didn't oh, he? Oh, did he? I, maybe that yeah. was that was the second year he wrote <laughs> yeah. it. But, year one, uh, he had the, the matching Gucci belt with the Gucci shoes. But we were opened with – welcome with open arms in Calgary, and we had a really good year that year. Our record was uh, um, 25 wins, five losses, and five ties. It was a 70-game season at that time. And uh, it was unbelievable, like that record. Did you ever play in the old corral? No, but I I want to say that that we ended up having a practice day where we had to go practice yeah. there because yeah. the saddle dome was taken. Yeah, and it was like it looked like it was built for like a like a like a, like a hor- like the horse bo- race. The boards were like this big. Yeah, if you got yeah if you got hit yeah. hard, your like your head was banging off yeah. the corner of the yeah. board. We had little Bobby Lalonde on our team, one of the smallest players to ever play. He was like five foot two or whatever it, at that and, time too. And, and yeah, and like he just kind of came up to the top of the boards, and and there was a three tiered bench. I don't know if you looked at the bench when you were practicing there. It's a three-tiered bench, and so you got on the bench, and you know you, you, nowadays even you get the shuffle going on the bench. If you're in the wrong, squeeze right, play, squeeze right. Yeah, if you're on the wrong, if you get on the other side of the door, the coach never seems to find you again. You must know what that's about. Yeah. Hey, shut up, Marshall, <laughs> fucker. We're getting comfortable here already. You're fucking throwing jabs at me. I love this shit. Uh, but anyhow, if you got on the third tier in the in the one in the bench in the in the corral there. You never got on the ice, and oh. if he did call your name, you couldn't get on because you had to step, step, and then you had to hop over these high boards. But anyhow, we had a big tough. As long team as you too. had an usher who could bring you a nice hot dog and some popcorn, yeah. maybe a cold brew, you'd be yeah. good. The yeah. best, yeah. best seat exactly. in the house. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to ask you. So when you sign, normally like players nowadays, they always treat themselves. It's usually a vehicle. Was, did you end up buying yourself a nice vehicle when you signed? You got that horse, dude. From the, from the <laughs> well, stampede. that was not the 19. You signed in Atlanta, you clown. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, I bought, I bought my parents a cruise. Um, they always wanted to go on a cruise, and so they went on the cruise. And uh, I bought a few other things, but I bought. Uh, I had the big, the big van going. The big vans were big back then, and the shag conversion shag. van. Yeah, shag. Like a big Winnebago. Then. Oh no, no, no! The the van had the no. railroad. Yeah, with the flames yeah, like, on the side, like in uh, 
What's the, what's the, like in the movie Old School when they when they end up kidnapping the guy? No, so, it wasn't quite that bad, but it had a refrigerator in it. And so this is 1978. It had the best stereo system, oh, yeah. you know, with the cassettes. Slide it in, and away you go. The lights and the thing and leather uh, ceiling and and custom license plates oh, saying the yeah. love bug. Oh, L- I didn't have the custom love uh, the custom uh, license plates, but anyhow, I had the big the shagging van wagon. Going. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> the vans are rocking, don't come back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's unreal. anyhow. Uh, so I had the van, and uh, but I was a pretty pretty simple guy. So anyhow. Yeah. That's all. You yeah. probably got good use of it, though. You would take it on like road trips in the summertime with the boys and stuff. Yeah, but well, from Atlanta back home, and then uh, you know, so hey, that's what I always wanted. My we as a family growing up, we always had the big long van to go to all the sports, all the tournaments, and all that kind of stuff, and and so on. And so I I got a little modern version of the family van when I signed my contract. Was, your, was your dad who taught you the game? You know, is, is no, my dad never played. Really, and uh, nor my mom. And then they really weren't athletic. But in Canada, as you know, everybody yeah. plays hockey, and so you know we had a pond down the corner, and uh, my dad did build a rink in the front yard, and so we played in the front yard, or we went down in the corner. And you but, just fell in love. Yeah, yeah. And my brothers played, and uh, you know, quite often you'd be playing outside with all your buddies, and you know. If you went to an organ, you know, that would that end to go to the organized practice. Ah, I don't want to go to practice. I'm playing here. But, you know, yeah. it uh, that's a different different way, uh, you know, a different way of life. But yeah. that's what we did. Road hockey in the summer, ice hockey in the winter. When R.A. mentioned off the off the jump that you were a stay-at-home defenseman, in junior were you a little more offensive? Were you always a guy who was a defensive shutdown guy? and, and, and Or did you have to change your game a little bit when you got to the show? Well, I you know, in junior, you, it, you kind of time out. You know, you're yep. the oldest guy there, so you do get some points. And so, I, I mean, I, I did have points. I did score. I did, had a lot of assists. But uh, I was always a good defensive player. And then when you get to the NHL, you, you kind of you, you, you go to your strengths. And that was my strength. And, you know, when you get to the NHL, there's a lot of skilled players there. And so the, the power play time's not there where you kind of get it in junior by default because yeah. you're the old guy on the team. So you knew when you got to that next level, that's how you were going to make yeah. the bones. Yeah, but I must admit, because people always, would you change anything? Like, I really wouldn't change anything, but I would work on some of my skills oh. better now if I were to do it over again. One the shot you and, and me both Marcia. yeah yeah but you know you just get so focused on playing and what you do best and yeah. i mean it did work for me but uh 1100 um, I, I had a couple quick ones yeah. uh how many players were wearing helmets when you broke into the league uh not many and the players that did wear a helmet they were referred to as a chicken shit you know, huh, look at, he's got a helmet on. So you yeah. were wearing one with the London Knights and the OHA. Yeah. So when you first started and you first get the training camp, dude, the take tra- it off. You just you're, you just went no dome. No, funny story. When I went to training camp, of course, as a trainer, you have your equipment. They just assume coming from junior, you would continue to wear a helmet. So I wore a helmet in training camp. I wore a helmet. There's a couple rare, very rare pictures of me with a helmet on, but there was always something in the back. Take it off. Take it off. Like I wanted to be like the guys that I watched on TV. Toronto Maple Leafs, Alan Stanley, Bobby Bond, and Tim Horton. I wanted to be like them, so I took it off, and and it stayed off. And uh, it, you know, uh, and a funny story is nineteen, oh, whatever the year was, eighty six. I don't know. Hey, it was the night Ron Hextall scored. So you can Google that. When did Hexy score? Against the Bruins. <laughs> Against the Bruins. Yeah. So that game. Um, I was racing for the puck and you know where the benches come together in the middle and the, yeah. and the glass comes together and it's like a 90 degree angle it's changed now like it's it's cha- it's uh, arced now but yeah, I since Patchy Reddy uh, and Chara that's when they changed it I yeah believe, well they, they should have changed it. it after me in 86 <laughs> for heaven's sakes but uh, but anyhow I was racing for the puck and I always like to point it out I was racing Cam Neely and Ray Bork to the puck i won the race everyone thought i was such a slow skater but i won the race and but when i got there i went crashing into the boards i hit my head right here split wide open then i fell back on the ice and hit my head here like not colder than a peacock blood everywhere the spectrum was just was dead silent 
And uh, so they get me on the stretcher. I'm bleeding. And, and I gave it the Hulk Hogan going on before I got on. I can give it this one. And oh, they fucking nuts. probably went nuts Oh, nuts yeah, for you. yeah. I went crazy. And so, But here's a twist to that story is my wife was at home uh, expecting our second child at the time. And nobody called her. No oh cell phones back then. And so no one had a quarter or a dime, whatever it was, to, to put it in, the, in a pay phone to the call. And so anyhow, you know, the neighbor kid come over and says, uh, my mom and dad said you might need a babysitter. So then she hightailed it. She come down to the, to the hospital. But I was okay, ended up fine. And, but I'm sitting in the hospital, and the doctor come in and said, Ron Hextall just scored. I'm giving like <laughs> I'm really messed up, man. <laughs> what the hell are you telling me? Hextall just scored, and uh, and so anyhow, I missed the couple games, major severe concussion, and then I, then I put a helmet on for the rest of the season that year, and uh, so that would would have been an eighty seven eighty eight season. And uh, I, looking back, I came back way too early, and Keenan was the coach, and he was starting to bench me because he said I wasn't playing good, and I thought I was. But uh, now that we all know a little bit more about concussions, I came back way too early. Oh, yeah. You know, I missed oh, a couple yeah. of days. But during that time I had the helmet on, and maybe it was payback, I don't know. I was never hit so many times with high sticks, elbows, hits from behind. So the following season – um, I ended up in Toronto. The, the the Flyers thought that my career was done because of the concussion and all that. They they let me go on the waivers. And usually when you when you're a waiver bait, your your That's career's it. done. So then I got picked up by Toronto, which was really good because that was my team growing up. It was it was pretty cool. And uh, and I said to my wife, I just want to make sure you're okay with it. And I'm gonna take the helmet off because I got hit too many times last year. So I took the helmet off. I'm not hit again. There's no more cheap shots, no more hits from behind, no nothing. So I played the rest of my career without a helmet. Well, it it sounds crazy, but a lot of guys have said, like, people had more respect. They were more aware of their sticks, of the hitting when there was no helmets. It sounds completely, like, counterintuitive, but I guess with the game being a little slower, there is some sort of argument that people knew what they were doing when there was guys with no helmets on, right? Like, in terms of, like, you see college hockey, they got cages on, and they're just animals running around killing yeah. each other. So, I mean, obviously, at some point, it had to same change. With, but. Same with the shoulder pads. They say guys wouldn't hit as hard, because if you hit a guy hard, and they used to have, like, it was, Shanahan like, pa- still it, it was, it was like paper yeah. mache, so you'd yeah. be feeling it just as much as the next guy. Exactly, yeah. And, then, like, two little funny, odd stories with regards to helmets. Like, so I have four kids, and they played the stick hockey down in the basement, and the, the mini sticks and all that. Never a problem with it was a great babysitting tool. Kids, go down and play hockey. <laughs> and then you could do whatever the heck you wanted. And Santa Claus brings them helmets for Christmas time, and they go down to play. Next, I'm down there breaking up a stick fight. <laughs> Never happened before because they respected each other. They put a helmet on. This is cool. Clunk, 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 hitting each other back and forth. And then I mentioned shinny hockey before. When you go to the pond, uh, there is... 20, 30, 40 people playing on the pond of all shapes and sizes, you know, ages, skill, ability. They don't wear no, no equipment. They just play shinny hockey. There's never a problem. But you put the equipment on, as you said, they feel invincible and they start running everybody all the time. So I, I don't know what the Let's answer is. Let's go back is. to no helmets. I yeah. like it. Yeah. And then go Let's back to small shoulder pads. Let's do it. <laughs> Smoking between periods. Too. Hacking, bu- yeah, hacking darts. <laughs> There's another eye opener. You must have had some smokers oh, on the team oh, too. Oh, like in junior, you never see it. You never see it. And you get to the Atlanta, I get to Atlanta, the NHL and, you know, there's Bobby McMillan in, in, after warm up in between periods. Like there's five, six, seven guys there out in the, having a cigarette and going, "What the heck is that?" I play with a guy named Scott Hotham, and his father played with the Penguins. Yeah. And he said when he first started playing in the NHL, there was more guys who were smoking on the team than not. So the guys who weren't smoking had to get out of the locker room. <laughs> oh really? Yeah, it was just like it was just kind of like guys would do it. It was just like it was it was a thing. They're like pussy. <laughs> uh, the, the other the other quick one I was going to ask you although we just you we talked for 20 minutes after my first one was when you uh when you originally moved back to Canada with the Calgary Flames I know you played in London was that your first experience of all of a sudden you're the talk of the town and like, like I don't want to say paparazzi but just like this high expectation of of delivering to win and everybody knowing who you were 
Yeah, it. I, I got to admit to it, it was neat. Like it was cool to be back and be the the talk of the town, and everybody knew who you were, and because it, it was such anonymity down in in Atlanta, like no one knew who you were, and that's maybe why we never won a playoff round. Because you know, if you failed, you could go home and forget about it, and nobody ever held you accountable. I'm not saying that the we, you know, you wanted to be like the crazy media in Toronto, and Montreal, where they pick everything apart and follow you around everywhere. But it was neat to be back in a Canadian city where hockey was all that mattered. Yeah. And, you know, you go anywhere, they got the the Flames jersey on or the Canucks jersey, whatever Canadian city. It, it was really neat to be back. Um, how did the move to Philly end up going down? Like, were you surprised, shocked, happy? What was the whole ordeal in terms of you getting traded or signing? I don't know how you ended well, up a flyer. Well, I'll never forget it. And, you know, I, I guess most guys are traded. And I cried like a baby. Like, it was, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was captain of the team, Calgary Flames. Yeah, that's and, tough. And uh, so I was always at the dressing room dress room early and all that stuff and um you know and the trainer said to bearcat that was the trainer it, the old time trainers were great they had no medical experience <laughs> <laughs> you're the head trainer uh, you need stitches <laughs> so make sure you got a six pack waiting in the stall though yeah, i'll tell you yeah. uh but bearcat and it's all cliff wants to see it so i go in and sit down to cliff i thought he was going to talk about the team or whatever We've traded you, and like I was shocked. Even though there was some rumblings, not so much of me, but we had a lot of injuries that second year in Calgary in the center corps, and uh, Philadelphia had a lot of injuries on the blue line. Bob Daly, if you remember the count, that was the the big Bob Daly, six foot six or seven or whatever. He broke his his ankle, career end an ankle injury, and so they needed defensemen. They had extra centermen, so the deal was captain for captain, yeah. me for Mel Bridgman, and. Uh, so I, away from Calgary, I go down to the city of brotherly love. And, uh, it's at 82? What year is this? 81. 81. 81. Yeah, actually, what's the date today? Well, November 11th, the, uh, Veterans Day, uh, I was traded in 81. And, it's 40 uh, years coming is that the f- yeah. Is that the first and only time captains have ever been traded? It before? happened recently, and I forget who it was. I know. I, I was re- brushing up one day. I saw that captain of a cap. I can't was, remember. Two. It was recent? It was a f- in the last we got ten, couple, to f- ten years, or well, we'll get G on it. We'll get no, G on it. Yeah. Unless you guys just want to sit here for five minutes in silence while the fans just no. It ends no. up being four hours. We're just like <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another yeah, five so, hour pod. Yeah, off to uh, off to uh, Philadelphia, and I must admit, and, and no disrespect to the Flames organization, but the minute I walked into the Flyers dressing room, I knew it was different. You know, Bobby Clark and Bill Barber. And, you know, the list goes, goes on and on. And it was just a different attitude. Mr. Snyder was the owner of the team, as you guys know. It was just different. It was, was he like it, Jerry Jones? Would he come down ever and, and you know, t- talk to the guys? Or did you never see him? No, he he was at every every home game. And he came in the dressing room, shook her hand, and thanked us for our, their, for our effort. Every wow. other, Win, lose, or draw. Every game he was in, wow. and it was it was it impressed me so much. And I've coached uh, a ton of minor like well, if you count the Warriors team, like I'm in mean, the 22 teams that I've coached since I've retired minor hockey and so on and so on competitive. That's one thing I still do is That's I awesome. shake everyone's hand after the game. Thank you, thank you. It was, it, it was so impressive that Mr. Snyder did that. He never come in and rant and raved and yelled and scream. You guys are this, and I'm going to get this and this. Coming in and thanked us for our effort every game. No two dollar, no two dollar bills though. No, <laughs> no, no $2. it's 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 crazy to think that that was six years after their most recent cup, I believe seventy five, and it's it's nuts to think they still don't have one. But you must have been so kind of amazed at like the culture there. You mentioned Bobby Clark and these guys and the the Broad Street bullies. Like you're expected to play a certain way. That right when you got into that locker room, you could tell. All right, this is a little bit of a step up from the Flames organization at that time. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't lift the weight or do anything extra until I got to Philadelphia. Like back in those days, summer was summer and training camp was where you lost 10, 15 pounds. And so I didn't, had not lifted a weight or done anything until uh traded to Philadelphia. They had Pat Croce, who was the first physical fitness full-time um, um trainer for an NHL team he Paul Holmgren knew him and uh they used to train a couple guys in the side then then Homer brought him into the team and it was great 
Holmgren, like, I, I want to ask about so many of those teammates oh, yeah. you have, but that guy, Ooh. oh, my God. Even, even when he was, you know, GM, guys are just so intimidated by him. So when he was playing, it must have been a different story, he's right? Mean. Just scary guy when he's yeah. getting pissed off. Yeah, he was mean and uh, great guy. And, like, so many tough guys are just great guys. But he was mean. And So back to the trade from, from Calgary to Philly. The year before, I said that Flames never won a playoff round when we beat Chicago. And then in the second round, we played Philadelphia. And uh, we uh, went seven games. And the seventh game was right here in the, in the spectrum. And uh, what a tough series it was. And we won. But my, my responsibility during the playoffs was um, every time Homer was on the ice, me and him, we had a lot of battles, man, a lot of battles. And so it was. they told me after it was the playoffs, you know, against the Flyers, they thought that I'd be a better flyer wow. than a flame. And, and so Keith Allen, the, tra- the GM at the time, made the trade for myself for Mel Bridgman. That's Bridger. where he saw it. He's like, we yeah. got to bring this guy in. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Who was so the it worked coach out in good. Philly when you got there? Pat Quinn. Oh, uh, Pat Quinn was the coach. Then it went to Bob McCammon, and then Mike Keenan came in. Yeah. Experience it all yeah. there. Yeah. I, I want to go back to your captaincy. You were a 22 year old captain in Calgary. Was there any apprehension on taking that on? Were you all gung ho about it? What was what was that experience like? I was pretty yeah, gung ho. Um, I was captain of my junior teams. I was captain in my minor hockey teams and all that kind of stuff. Okay. And so I'm very proud to say that I was captain or assistant captain of every team that I played on. And uh, so I welcomed it. Um, and it was it was neat. And I'm waiting for the for all their parties to happen. So the first captain of the Calgary Flames, and I get a free trip out to Calgary and a few beers when I'm there. Maybe they'll give me a horse again. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, Calgary is a great place to go. Their their alumni there is tremendous. And so one of our we have four kids, and one of our chil- one of our kids lives in Calgary. So it's neat to go out and do some Flames alumni stuff. And of course, I get to see him. Did you have to adapt at all to a, to such a veteran room being a captain in the previous spot? No, I. What I realized, I had a lot to learn, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, the big thing when we got when I came to Philly, we had Cooperalls. Remember them, oh, damn yeah. Cooperalls? Yes. Oh, oh my god, that wasn't terrible. a thing in Calgary. They no, were the only, only two team in yeah. Vancouver too. Hartford Whalers. Yeah, had that war. Why was it cheaper? Or what was they the thought, thought it was going to reduce injuries, but it didn't. And I oh, hated him. Yeah. I hated him because you would slide on the ice because I was a shot blocker. And so your timing was based on your socks. And back in then we had these woolen socks, not like the nylon mesh fabric they have now. And so you would stick to the ice and you'd break a block a shot. Well, the first couple of games I go to block a shot and whoosh, I'm just sliding right through and I'm ducking the <laughs> shot because it's not, not hitting me in the body. So, uh, but I had a lot to learn. Uh, Clarkie was... Clark, he was unbelievable to, to play with. And, uh, you know, I, I won't go into the whole deal, but a, a cool story about Clarky and blah, blah, blah. Was, you know, was, everyone goes through ups and downs during the NHL career. And I played good, and then I wasn't playing so good in, in Philly, and I was losing ice time. And if you're a professional athlete, the worst thing that can happen to you is you take your ice time away or take field time away from you. So I was used to playing 20, 25 minutes, and then I was going in reverse. And then yeah, it's harder to play. Then you're a bench warmer, and, of course, it's the coach's fault. You know, how can he not be playing me? But in actuality, it was my fault. And I asked Clarkie one day, what do you what do? you do? Like, what's the magic thought, sauce? And, you know, he thought about it, and he says, you know, Brad, I've never had a bad practice. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because we all work hard in a game. Like, games are easy. Yeah, we can work hard. But the hard thing is, is to work hard and practice all the time. So I started following him around. I'm just a young kid. He was 34 at the time. I couldn't keep up to him. And so that's when the light bulb went on me, on, on for me. Maybe I should listen to Pat Croce, and maybe I should take a page out of Bobby Clark's book and not have any bad practices, no days off. And uh, so that's when the light bulb, yes, I was a captain, and yes, I was a, a good leader, I think, but I didn't understand what it took to be a top-notch stay-at-home NHL defenseman. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Bobby Clark, you talk about a rock style. What was it like tailing around with him in this town back then? Oh, it was uh, – you know what's neat is when we have alumni events and then the stories are basically all the same in the dressing room. But then as you have a few beers, then the 70s guys get together and start telling oh, stories geez. and the 80 guys start telling stories. But the stories from old-time hockey are, are priceless. And uh, 
like let's i think we can all agree the modern day athlete is is pampered spoiled catered to there's so much money now it's yeah. changed yeah, yeah it's it's just way different yeah and so back in the day like we flew commercial you know you got a middle seat and you know you're sitting like this from you know from vancouver to toronto and like oh my goodness and you can't even two goals the night before choking on smoke for your teammates <laughs> and, and this is the worst part they had a smoking remember the smoking section oh 14a yeah the, 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 that's the smoking section back. on the planes yeah, yeah on the yeah. planes as and if so, the smoke built. yeah yeah exactly <laughs> right when it hit row 16 yeah. <laughs> and uh so anyhow we had i, I look back and, and we flew commercial we had so much fun in the airports we weren't allowed to drink in the airports but that we was lo- the team. Why? Because they did one time get out of hand, so they kind yeah. Of oh, we used to drank all the booze in the yeah. airport. Dude. We used to love the layovers in Chicago because it was such a big airport. You could find a bar and there'd be no coaches <laughs> around, and the rookie always had to stand at the front of the bar oh, and give on. the hands up. Oh, the coach is coming! <laughs> oh, down your beers! <laughs> yeah. back yeah, to the waters. Yeah. But we used to be in the airport, and we'd have put a dollar bill. On a string, and the guy would bend over to pick it up. Like, and you pull it away. Like we had so much fun in the airports, man alive. The old shit, the old shit dollar. Yeah, yeah, man alive. I think back and and uh, so anyhow, it was good. You know, you know what the they were doing uh, in, in my time? They were when we were playing the American League. They would uh, they would glue the toonies to the to the floor. So that people would be trying to pick them up. Yeah. You just stand there, <laughs> stand there nonstop. What, what other pranks were guys doing? Because like that, that was the age of where like guys were doing the craziest shit to stay entertained because there was no phones around. You know, there's nothing around. And I shake my head. I hear the stories of the modern-day athletes, and they play uh, – what's the game they play? Um, Which one? Uh, on the phones? Like video games? No, Xbox? video ge- – Xbox. The ones – the big one that they play. Fortnite? Fortnite and all that kind of stuff. And some of them, they buy – they go into the city, they buy a TV, and they just leave it there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, what the hell is that? That's fuck you money, uh, yeah. Marcia. That's oh, what they my call goodness. That. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, Murphy. So. That's not $85,000 signing yeah, bonuses so anymore. we had to entertain ourselves and, you know – the team after every practice the team went for lunch sometimes it's turned into dinner but uh we, we, yeah, we just had so much fun well you there was a there was a famous restaurant slash bar that you guys would always attend and didn't during i don't know if it was during your tenure at one point it ended up burning down you guys ended up wearing these armbands it was rexy's right across the bridge it was rexy's it was the famous uh the the you know it, a lot of the guys lived in jersey so they wanted to after the game they wanted to get out and I always tell people, if you want to find a hockey player, especially an old one, first bar on the left. Like, you, you, you leave and just check the first bar. There's going to be players in there. And uh, so Rexy's was a fabulous place, and the guys hung out there. It was mobbed on the Stanley Cup. They had to close the bridge down uh, because people were just migrating, across, walking across the bridge to go to Rexy's. And there's pictures. There's thousands and thousands of people around Rexy's. And uh, it's still there, new owner. It's still there. I stopped by, have a few beers, and they got great pizza, great wings. And uh, I actually, so we started started going there. I uh, I proposed to my wife at Rexy's. It's such a romantic spot. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I like hand you one of those wings, honey, and uh, yeah, here's your ring. <laughs> yeah. A couple but, free pictures. That's the only reason I'm doing it here. Yeah, we got a yeah, promo going yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, uh, yeah, Rexy's is a good spot. And then uh, in L.A., you guys are too young. You never went to the Melody Lounge. No. No, and it was right by the old L.A. Forum. Once again, it's because of curfew. It was You always went to the closest bar so you could get home. You could have one last, and then you can get home quick. Melody Lounge. What was curfew then? That was enforced? Yeah, that's yeah. bullshit on the road. Yeah, yeah it, was, it was enforced often. They yeah. check the rooms and yeah. stuff, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I remember in junior, go back to Bill Long, <laughs> me and my buddy Dean Hopkins, we played junior. He was drafted by L.A. And uh, one of those things, you, everyone always asks about your buddies from NHL. But I'm still very close to a lot of my junior friends because you, you experience so much in junior hockey. And, uh, You're growing up together. Yeah, yeah. And so Dean Hopkins, we've stayed in touch. He lives in uh, out on the East Coast now. But it, uh, so we, we're in, uh, we in Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, we decided curfew, it must have been 11 o'clock or whatever, so we were late for curfew. And so we had it all figured out. We were sneaking into the water tower in. That's where we were staying. We were sneaking in. We thought we had it licked, and we come up the, the back stairway onto, on, you know, onto our floor. 
And here's Bill Long in his pajamas. Oh, no. Sitting on a chair. He's got a chair outside our door. And he's even got one of them, you know, in the old movies. He's got the sleeping cap on. Yeah, but he's a Scrooge. And he was, he was sleeping on the thing. So, like, we couldn't even tiptoe by him because he was right in our door sleeping. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sleeping. He was right in our door sleeping, for heaven's sake. So, anyhow, there's a good... Uh, uh, a good curfew story oh, no there. Oh, shit. Yeah. That's a, well, I, so I was going to bring up during your Flyers days, you guys ended up losing to the Oilers twice. Twice, in yeah. In the finals. And one of them was the one of the best finals ever, right? Yeah, it went, ended up going yeah. Seven, yeah. seven games. Yeah. Well, let's, let's dive into the series in particular, but I heard that you can't even watch any championship celebration now because of like that – Probably that horrible feeling you had at the bottom of your stomach of losing two times in the finals. Yeah, I get I get pissed off watching, and uh, it's just because you know when you play professional sport or any sport, the object is to win. And you know, my hand was this close to the cup twice, and we lost, and so I just get agitated, and and uh, so I just turned it off. I still watch the the playoffs. I keep track of it, but when it comes to the the trophy the, print. Yeah, yeah, I just turn it off, and That's especially that in '87 we went seven games, and you know we were behind three-one, and uh, uh, game five here in the Spectrum, they still say it was the loudest ever been in any any Philadelphia sports arena. JJ Daniel scored. And the place, you know, they have all them dials that, you know, the rock concerts. Yeah, de- de- decibels. Yeah. yeah, they turn it yeah. down, turn it down. It was louder than any rock concert ever was in the old spectrum there. And then we win game six. And uh, oh, I'm sorry, that was game six. We won game five in Edmonton. That was game six here. And then game seven, uh, you know, we had a lead actually in the game. And oh, that uh, was back in Edmonton or that was Back here? in Edmonton. Oh. And uh, it just... It just didn't happen. And I'll tell you what, too, another, uh, you know, so we lose. And uh, the parade was pl- was planned. And, you know, they just, they, so we're flying back on the plane. They ran out of beer. It's the first time I ever drank red wine. They ran out of beer, so I had to have something to drink. And so my wife picks us up at the airport. She says, what the heck were you doing? So all the guys, our oh. teeth, our lips, our tongues, it's all red <laughs> from drinking red wine because they had ran out of beer. And I'm saying, like, Ugh. what the hell were you thinking? If we win, we're going to drink. If we lose, we're going to drink. Yeah, no, so yeah. how could you not have enough beer? So anyhow, we went into the red wine. But one of the most, if you can say you had fun after losing a Stanley Cup. So there's a lot of bars around here open 24 hours. And one of them was on my way home, Evergreen Evergreen Lounge. So I said to the guys, uh, "Let's stop for a couple more drinks in the Ever to the at the Evergreen Lounge." And so my wife dropped me off there, and uh, a bunch of the guys were there. Clarky came, Homer came, Keenan came, and so we walk into this tavern at six in the morning, five in the morning, six in the morning, and all the the local rubbies are in there. And in walk the Flyers. So. Anyhow, my wife's family, huge musical family. She's got a huge family. So I call up her, her brothers, say, get down here with your instruments. And so by 8 o'clock in the morning at the Evergreen Tavern, I got a live band playing. The Flyers are in there. Keenan's in there. We're all laughing, joking. Get, since the game drinking. ended. Yeah. Kitchen wasn't open yet, so we ordered, as soon as the pizza place, or we ordered pizza in. Oh, we had a great time. Sure. Great time laughing and joking. And, of course, in the back of our mind, we were drowning our sorrows because yeah. we just lost. Yeah. So when you, I mean, you, you lose to these Oilers teams. I think the best team, sorry to interrupt, the, I think oh. the best team, no disrespect to the Montreal Canadiens, but I think the Oilers of the 80s were the best team ever. Oh, my, that's what I was going to say. Like, what, before that series, or both those series, like, what is the game? What are you saying about what do we do against Gretzky, Messier? Like, how are you guys approaching playing? Like, the greatest to ever do it in, in, in his prime, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was, uh, you know, they changed the way the game of hockey was. And, you know, just Glenn say their power play. Okay, Gretzky, Messier, Curry, coffee. <laughs> um, somebody else just jump out to be the other defenseman. Yeah. You know, like it, it was unbelievable. And the talent that they had. I think they have seven Hall of Famers, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. And we have one from that team. Mark Howe finally got in a couple of years ago. and uh, But, no, it was a great team. And, and the skill that they had. I remember when they first started wheeling and dealing, their practices were intimidating to watch. You'd be standing there. Because back in the early days, our game was up and down. 
and dump it in and then you chase you bang you crash and but you know then the stasis come in and they start this down low cycle like what the hell is that how do you defend that but the oilers they were doing these full ice passing drills and the skill level the drop passes oh, all that oh, stuff, they're right? the like we talk about the saucer but like everyone can just raise the puck now I could never do that, but they, you they never threw a sauce. Oh, you had a straight oh, stick, okay. Mark. Yeah, <laughs> and but um, you should see my stick. We were at a we were at an, uh, an autograph thing for with the Warriors. They were given the proceeds from this jersey thing, and so the Warriors all went and hung around. One of the collectors had a stick of mine from 1980, uh, Calgary Flames. It was still taped and everything, and so they bought it and they presented it to me. You should see it. You can, if someone wants to Google, you know, Brad Marsh, Calgary Flames, I got the, the big stop and you'll see it Wally. And it is like a two by four. It's on, <laughs> the guys are laughing at it. It's un, unbelievable. But uh, what were we talking about? We were the talking, so, well, we were talking about the fact, <laughs> we're talking about the fact, the fact you couldn't sauce oh, or pass yeah, with a yeah. two by four. Yeah, exactly. But the drills that they were doing, like up and down and regroup, who the hell ever heard of a regroup? But Edmonton was regrouping and passing the puck. It was incredible. G's got the picture out. Look at that table. Yeah, you had a good salad too, Marshy. Yeah. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. What happened there? No, I don't know. I, I you got the RA my, special now. I tell my granddaughters that, uh, and they still tell the story to everyone. I skated so fast that it all fell out. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So it's like Rick talking. He used to have a nice set yeah, of uh, salad. Yeah, one old yeah. peachy Brad Marsh rookie card. Yeah. That's, look at those yeah. gloves too. I always think of Messi when I see those gloves. I guess you had them before. Yeah. He did. Were you? Yeah. Were, but were you guys going in with the mentality like, "Hey, we get that these guys are skilled, but we're going to try to beat the fucking wheels off them." Yeah, we knew we could outwork them. We knew we could skate with them and outwork them. We couldn't outskill them, and so we did the best that we could to slow them down. And, and I mean, obviously, we did a great job. But we lost in five games in in '85. Uh, we won the first game, then they they won the last four. But every game was a one goal game. We were right there too in '85. The last game got a little out of hand, and um, it got out of hand. They uh, ended up seven three or something like that, and big brawl in in game five. And it's quite funny if you you can look it up on the. I ended up in a big fight that, with Don Jackson. That's what I want to bring up. We got the Canadians version of it from Shane Corson, the the pregame brawl at Montreal. Oh yeah, yeah, that was classic. <laughs> we got to get yeah, the Philly side of that. Yeah, where, where, were, where were you during all that? You just took on. Who'd you say? I'm sorry. Oh, I was talking about Don Jackson and Edmonton. Oh, we had okay. a big brawl in Game Five, and and uh, but the Montreal game, uh, you know, in the Montreal form brawl and warm up i still say the canadians have had it planned like i don't i don't was that that was claude lemieux who was being a rat during warm-up right yeah yeah and so he always shot the puck in the empty net once the team left and so um chico rash he was the backup goalie to ron hextall and uh so chico was waiting for him and so in lemieux he came around his net up to and he just you know shot the puck to the open net then he was skating off and Chico went flying out on the ice and slid across like this and stopped it from going in. And Lemieux, being the coward that he is, comes out and grabs Chico Rash. Like, come on, yeah, yeah, come, yeah on. come on, you know. And and so Ed Hospodar, come, he was with Chico. He comes charging out. Then Shane Corson comes charging out. And I remember the trainers coming in and say, hey, there's a fight on the ice. So we all go out on the ice. But if you look at the tape, Montreal came out en masse with all their equipment on. We had all our equipment off because in, what do you do after warm up? You yeah, loosen you, your yeah. skates. Like Doug Crossman came out in his flip flops. He had his sandals on. Like Cross, what are you doing? And Dave Brown came out. Dave Brown came out and he had nothing on. He just had his suspenders. So him and Chris Nyland square up. Oh my. And and Nyland had nothing to grab onto. And Brownie beat Dave him up Brown. pretty good. Oh, he's another scary guy. Oh my God, that's yeah. who I feel like most guys say might be the scariest ever. Yeah. yeah. He, I was telling this story earlier today, and he would skate and warm up between the blue line and the red line and just look down like that. And you didn't want to catch his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> the boogeyman. <laughs> yeah. I'm like this. Warm up skate so by. the big brawl goes on and on and on, and uh, there's lots of side fights. Uh, Mike Keenan locked Hexy in the dressing room because Hexy would have been out there in the middle of the fight. He he <laughs> locked him in the old dressing room in the Montreal form, and he's he <laughs> Hexy's in like a caged animal in there. Let me out! Let me out! But anyhow, then we go back to the dressing rooms, 
and they clean the ice and they drop the puck. No penalties, no nothing. We just start just started the <laughs> like game. Like nothing like, happened. Yeah. Nothing yeah. from that. Yeah, yeah. But what was funny too is is one of the, our alumni here in town. We're very very proactive and we do a lot of different things. And one of the things we started was I call it Friday night fights. And so we bring in tough guys from around the league and flyer tough guys. We show their videos on the on the TV. And then the two tough guys that were fighting are on the stage talking about what they were thinking about when no they're beating way. the shit out of each other. So the first one that we did, um, we started, uh, I had it set up like a hockey game. So, you know, everybody's out drinking and having the, the happy hour and so on. And then, you know, the lights dim and warm up starts. And so everyone sits down. No one knows what to expect. And there's only one version of, of the brawl on ice in 87. It's in, in French. And so it starts with, you know, Chico coming out and the broadcast is going, blah, 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 Sacre Blue, what the hell's going on? And, and, uh, and then, you know, they show Nyland and, and it goes on and it's all in French and the Flyer fans are just loving it because Brownie's, you know, swinging away and they're going, ah. And then the lights come up and there's Dave Brown and Chris Nyland on the stage talking about the fight oh, it was unbelievable ah. and then we go on we had uh, Terry O'Reilly and, and Dave Schultz there who fought like 18 times in their career oh, <laughs> oh my god and Terry O'Reilly is one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet as is Schultz but so we showed three fights one that Schultz won one that Terry won and then we showed a draw yeah you yeah. didn't want to have a fight I keep on everybody yeah, happy yeah, yeah. show the yeah. other 15 we'll, we'll be yeah. here for yeah. three weeks hey so there was there's a clip like I think it was probably about 10 years ago of a couple of former CFL rivals and you know they, yeah. they were like one of the guys had a cane and they were on stage and like the guy with the cane swung at the other guy because they were still ani- yeah. still, yeah. still yeah. animosity yeah. about this that was this CFL classic. game between the, yeah. two, the two Rough Rider teams going at it that was Angelo <laughs> Moscow and Joe Cap. Oh, Okay. Yeah, yeah so Joe Cap was the running back, and Moscow was the big linebacker, and he was still pissed at him from their careers <laughs> 20, 30 years before. And 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 I I feel like it all built up more because like you talk to anybody from like when they were playing in the sixties, seventies, like guys rarely got traded, and even if they saw each other in the summertime, let's say with a golf tournament, there was no interaction. No, it was like they they no they, tummy sticks. There was no tummy sticks going on back then. Yeah. So what was it like getting them back on stage together? Was that what, really the first time they were able to like interact in that way? Yeah, it was great. And and you know, uh, uh, knuckles like every other word is swear word. Oh, f bomb. <laughs> yeah, and and he was and with that real hard accent. And Brownie's <laughs> like a choir boy. And Brownie really didn't know what to quiet say. Off the ice He's stuff. quiet. Yeah, yeah, and. Uh, and so that was funny, and then but Knuckles he just kept going and going. It was hilarious, and then then we had a couple of the, the Broad Street bullies that they talked. And Joe Watson, who you're golfing with tomorrow, was uh, was good, and uh, and then we had Dave Brown and, and Daryl Stanley, who they were big here. The Bruise Brothers was their big handle because they're two tough kids there from out west, and and anyhow it's great. And and we had it lined up to do again next year. We had. Uh, and uh, uh, the following year, but then uh, obviously COVID canceled. So it's it's on the books for again and uh, uh, sometime in 22, and we'll just start it again. And Marty McSorley was coming in for the last one, and uh, that's a and great so, idea. Oh, oh yeah, oh it's great. And you know what? The fans love it. The people loved it, and it it's just it was a great night, and the guys loved it. It was really fun. I want to ask the the eighty seven final. It was very low scoring for that era. I think it was thirty seven goals in seven games. Why was that with such a high powered offense like Edmonton? This stay at home defenseman <laughs> shot him <laughs> down. There you go. Teed right you <laughs> right up. Good stick. Your stick weighed ten pounds. You had a yeah, good one. Yeah. Break it. That was when Hextall won MVP. As well. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We had Hexy. Hexy was unbelievable. And you know what? I don't. Th- I know Grant Fuhrer's in the Hall of Fame. I don't think he gets enough credit because. There was really no defense played in in Edmonton for a lot of years, and his best games were eight five games, mm-hmm. where that save that he made to keep it eight five and not eight six w- was tremendous. Like Fuhr was unbelievable because he was left to his own devices so many times. Yeah, it numbers, was that bad. Eh? Really? Yeah. Numbers weren't crazy, but Gretzky even says like he he always stopped the one he had to. Was, yeah, yeah. Interesting to hear. Uh, Mike Keenan, we mentioned him earlier. Was he good for your game? I know some pl- uh, players liked him, some hated him. What was your idea? Well, he was young when you had him. Yeah, right out of out of college in Canada, Canadian college. I think Toronto, York, York University in Toronto. But yeah, it was his first coaching gig in the NHL. Oh. So 
he was hard and tough, but not as tough as his reputation became. Iron Mike. He and couldn't so do on. it right off the bat. That's correct. But he was a tough son of a gun. Uh, but you know, when you look at your coaches that you've had over your career, and it, it all comes down to ice time. And if you play a lot, you usually get along or like the coach. And so I was pretty lucky. I, I got 25 minutes a game, 30 minutes a game, if there was lots of penalties. Uh, so you play that much good coach but I there's a lot of my teammates that could not stand him and uh but I was fortunate I was one of the ones that played from like a technical standpoint was he good or was he just like strictly motivator uh very good with the motivation uh sometimes through fear um but what he did to Mike, and if you look at those teams from the 80s when Mike coached, there's a lot of players, including myself, and there's a lot of guys that will say this, we had our career years under Mike. And what he did for me was he was the first coach that kind of had an up-tempo practice. Some of the practices that you used to have in, in, in the 70s and Sitting stuff. Sitting around like, a lot. Oh, standing around. Russia and, style. And doing breakouts and doing this. And, you know, Fred Creighton was my first coach in the NHL. Like, the guy's called Blue Line Freddy because that's all he ever did, hard between the blue lines. Like, oh, my God, again? Like, <laughs> And uh, although he had one of the best lines I ever heard was we, we had a bad game, and and uh, he come in and he wrote on the board, uh, uh, practices at 9 o'clock. You know, he said, practice at 9 o'clock and tell your wives to pack a lunch because you're going to be here all goddamn day. <laughs> that was a pretty good line by Blue Line Freddy. But Mike, he was the first one that had an up-tempo practice, and he challenged me to be faster. He challenged me to be better. And it was the challenge that he brought into the dressing room that some players, you know, didn't accept, but other players ate it up. And myself, I had my best years under Mike, and I was a better NHLer because of Mike and uh, because he challenged me. And I accepted the challenge. And that was right along the time that I was starting to get in shape and starting to work hard. 12, month, 12 months a year was my hockey career because I worked harder in the summer, so I would be better in the, in the wintertime. So. It's a young Rick Tockett on that squad as well, 22 years oh, old. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. He young. was a madman. Oh, he was good. He was he was good. He was drafted as an eighteen. Made the team as an eighteen-year-old, and he was a flyer as soon as he walked in the dressing room. Yeah. He looks like a flyer. Played like a flyer, yeah. and uh, he's coming in the hockey hall in the Flyers Hall of Fame next week. Yeah, uh, along with Paul Hongren, which is really cool. But uh, no talk was a talk was a, a a good man, good player, and. Uh, um, Doing a great job with yourself on TNT, but he's he, he's amazing. Like he's like yeah, he's he's everything everything as described. And you mentioned just that flyer element. Like he still kind of walks to the caveman and always looks like he's ready to fucking go. Yeah, he, yeah. like he just looks like he's tough as nails. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, he does. Uh, and and uh, while well, we were talking about Brownie, like Brownie plays in the alumni game, he still looks like he wants to tear somebody apart. He's like, got that, yeah, he's oh, got he's that just mean got that mug. Mean Never look. lose it. Yeah, yeah. But he, yeah. but but talks mentioned it. He just said like you know, it was kind of like embodied him when he come to the Flyers organization that like it's it's the team mentality and it's like everyone is one and it, it just really stuck with him throughout his career and like the the life lessons that it's taught him is, have lived with him forever. Yeah. And he, yeah. and he and he kind of has that approach to to his everyday life now. So it, it's been cool to to hang out with him and just hear all these stories of how it just was. Uh, by the way, that trade Grinelli told us Callahan for St. Louis was the uh, captain for captain trade. Okay, that we couldn't there you that go. we couldn't recall. Holy shit! I wouldn't have got that. Never in a million years I would I have gotten that, that trivia question. Now after uh, Philly went to Toronto, we mentioned earlier it wasn't a great era for the Leafs back then, but there was some some young studs on that team: Old Czech, Damp, Foose, a young Wendell Clark. Uh, also, Bo- uh, Borja Salmon was like I know he was kind of on his way out. What was the experience playing with him? He was one of the first Swedes to really dominate in the NHL. Yeah, he was at the end of his career there. But I tell you what, he's held in high regard in the Flyers dressing room because the Flyers and the, and the Leafs used to battle in the 70s, and they used to go after Borea. The two players that come across at the same time was was uh, Borea and Inga Hammerstrom, if you remember that name. And he... Uh, Guys thought they might be able to bully him, and you couldn't. Yeah, he was tough. He was tough. And uh, so he, he, Borea has a lot of respect with the old time flyers okay. and, uh, but Tron, I say all the time and everyone knows Harold Ballard or knows of, of, of Harold Ballard. And to me, it was a dream come true to play for the Toronto Maple Leafs. But unfortunately, Harold owned the team at the same time. And he was just a senile old guy yeah. that had no business being in the NHL, but, 
He was. And, Still got uh, to play for original six teams. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, team, yeah right? it was cool. I remember our first game was in the, my first game with the Leafs was in the Boston Garden. And remember the old dress room in the Boston Garden? Like it was like three small compartments type of thing and defensemen in one room. So anyhow, I, I got there and uh, they gave me number three. Back in those days, you just took whatever number was given to you, you know. None of this 47 and 80, like what the hell's all that, you know. Uh, so I got number three, and, and I'll tell you, I, 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 I always kind of get ready get ready early, so I got all my stuff on, and I took my jersey into the washroom in the old Boston Garden there, and I put it on, and I stood, and I looked at myself in the mirror, and I said, hey, this looks pretty That's good. Awesome. And if if I, if cell phones were invented there, I would have taken a, a selfie and sent it to my mom because I have the identical picture from when I was six and seven, I got a Toronto Maple Leaf jersey, no. Toronto Maple Leaf gloves, pants, socks for Santa Claus for Christmas. And if so I did the, the same pose. You remember all, you'd always have your, your shirt on, buttoned up underneath your hockey side. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> yeah. That must have been a thing from you the – You already from, had yeah. a tattoo, dude. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so I, uh, I um, um, I ended up getting a, got one of the guys to take a picture or one of the photographers that was there to take a picture, and I got it. So my mom liked putting them side by each on, oh, on the fireplace. That's so, awesome. Yeah. It was a thrill to put on the Maple Leaf jersey. Now, you were kind of the John Scott before John Scott. Was it in Toronto when you ended up getting the nod to the All-Star game? No. I got a nod to the All-Star game in Calgary. Oh, in Calgary. And, um, but I never played in the game. I was here in Philadelphia, and, and I was going to Calgary to play because it would have been cool because I got traded from Calgary, and the All-Star game was in Calgary. I flew from here to Toronto. Snowstorm of the century hit. Oh. So I sat on a bar stool in the Toronto airport drinking, watching the goddamn game on the – on the on the, yeah. Brutal. Uh, yeah. What All-Star yeah. game yeah. Yeah. snowed in. Yeah, and so anyhow, then my next All-Star game uh, at that time was in 92. I was in Ottawa. Oh, that's right. I was in Ottawa, and they they picked the teams, and the commissioner got to have uh, a senior citizens pick. So <laughs> it, myself and Randy Car Carlisle no way. Was, was the other player. And uh, hey, so, you only had 33 goals in your career, but you ended up scoring in the All Star game. Scored in the All Star really? game, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I had a goal and an assist in the All Star game. So it was funny. I come back to Ottawa. We had a terrible a team deal. in Ottawa. That was the first year yeah. of its expansion, right? Yeah, yeah. So I tell people to do the math. So at that time we played 82 games. So you do the math. That's 164 possible points. We had 21. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it's a long season. That is a long season. But anyhow, season. I go to the All Star game and and uh, and so I come back and and, and um, I got a goal and assist and and Wayne, how many how many All Star games has Wayne played in? Every single year he was in the NHL. Yeah, probably. and so so there was a big big sign that the the fans put up and it said you know ninety ninety two All Star game. Wayne Gretzky, then the G and the A and the T for total points, zero, zero, zero. <laughs> then they had Marsh, goal one, assist one, total points, two. Yeah, I got a picture of it, too. Yeah. I got a picture Suck of it, Suck on that, Wayne. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I, have to he bring was, that up on TNT. Th that's when he took his vacations. So yeah. He's probably just yeah. hitting the sauce oh, and enjoying yeah. life then. But a funny story with the All-Star game, too, that actually was one of the most embarrassing moments ever. So remember that they have the skills competition the night before. So we're in the Montreal Forum. They set the, the skills competition up. So when people ask me about good coaches and the Scotty Bowman comes up, I always go, oh, he's an idiot. And everyone's like, oh, how can you do that? Well, let me tell you. So at that time, you know, the skills competition is up. They have the fastest skaters. I'm not going in there. They have the hardest shot. I'm not going in that. Scotty Bowman puts me in the accuracy shooting. Oh, that's a panic. Say, that's kind of the, like, That's the a panic. That's oh. what I would get thrown in. Oh. You're like, oh, all right, yeah. And I'm sitting, so you get nervous. I'm shitting a brick because <laughs> the Montreal Forum is sold out, and I have to go in the accuracy shooting Just contest. hit one target, please. Exactly. <laughs> so I'm sitting there, and you have a passer on the left and a passer on the right, so you alternate. So the first pass comes out i miss the net like shot it high over and if 10 shots and so then the second one comes out and i miss again oh. and the old then you start gripping it tighter oh the old french he's, he was like jeopardy you know the mumble before the jeopardy oh, oh no. then i miss the next one the next couple one, the next whistles one. 
and I'm sweating. I'm 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 pissed at myself and so on. And and the crowd now is is a mixture of laughter and a mixture of. I'm sure they're all thinking, how is this guy in the All-Star game? <laughs> and so I go 0 for 10. Oh, 0 for 10. You didn't get one? I didn't get one. Oh, I go 0 for God. 10. Hey, you were saving him interview. for the game the next oh, night. In the though. interview. <laughs> I, I go 0 for 10. And then, you know, at that time, there's some sit on the bench and the, or you're kneel on the ice. I went back and I found the spot all by myself. And I was sitting there just – I couldn't hide anywhere. And Bill Clement – who is a good buddy of mine. We played together in Atlanta and Calgary. Now, he's in the broadcast, and uh, and so he's on the ice broadcasting back for this, whatever it was at the time, and he's on his skates, and he comes over with this big smile, and he's going <laughs> to inter- interview me. And then I was a ventriloquist, and all of a sudden, I, without moving anywhere, the only, 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 like, get the <laughs> and he knew. So he just come and he did a flyby. <laughs> just did a flyby. Didn't and Marshy's not going to be interviewed. Yeah, yeah. by, by the way, you, you, you know Bork went right after and went four for four. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And did, uh, did Pierre Maguire put the skates on one year and do the All Star game like that where he was going around with the mic? I think uh, for yeah. a couple of years, they, yeah, yeah, they had that. Guys out there. So that was like, that was that experience. Oh, oh that was bad. Yeah, that was post, bad. Yeah. Post Thanks a lot, Scotty. Interviews. Yeah. And, uh, so anyhow, then I score the next night, and it's all good. And we talked about the dressing room right at the start of the interview. So I go back to uh, the, the Senators practice the next day. The damn coach made me practice. Like, ooh. Bonus, that a, right? That Rick bonus. Rick bonus. That was a tough practice. So I go into the dressing room, and they've got a bullseye in my oh, stall that is course, bigger than boys. everything. And – but it, that's the dress room, and the yes. guys were peeing themselves laughing, and I come in. Of course, I'm laughing by then at that because I was the hero. I scored a goal in the All Star game, but uh, but it was it was funny. So it came full circle from being, you know, I don't know if humiliated was the right word, but uh, I think it, I think it story, ended up though. well, and it, it ended up being a good story on the yeah. Chicklets podcast at least. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow, so uh, well. Also, all I mean. What, do you have anything else for him? Yeah, actually, yeah, I uh, did a little intel. Is there a story about you, like, during the World Juniors in Russia, hiding in a closet, something to do oh, with Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, already <laughs> digging up the, the good stuff. Where'd you get that one? I don't, can't tell. Can't, yeah. Can't give up my source. Yeah. <laughs> no, we was the World Juniors in uh, – I played in the World Juniors twice. Uh, once, the uh, first time in 76 in uh, in the Czechoslovakia. It wasn't split at that time. Right. We end up with a silver medal there, and that was that was a very cool experience. And the next year was in uh, Montreal, and it's the first time prior to that a club team would go over and represent Canada. That was the first time they had an All Star game. Uh, I'm sorry, an All Star team from around all of Canada. And Wayne was as a 16 year old was on, on the team, and uh, uh, so it was played in Mon- Montreal and Quebec. So anyhow, long story short, we end up with the bronze medal there. And back in them days, they didn't have, you know, the semifinals and the playoffs and all that stuff. It was a round robin. Yeah, and most points and goals for would be yeah. the tiebreaker and stuff. Yeah, exactly. And so we ended up with the with the uh, bronze medal. And so we were having a f- few beers in, in the hotel and so on and so on. And, we're, you know, we're not playing anymore. So I go down to the front desk. This is when you could do anything. And, you know, I said I needed a key to this particular room. And they gave me a key. And so um, so I just, you know, I knock on the door. And uh, I'll speed the story up. I knock on the door. The the, the Russian sticks his head out, like, looking back and forth. And so I kept it up. And then, and then he came out to chase me. But I hid around the corner. And I went into his room. <laughs> And hid in the closet, and I had a big bucket of ice water, and I was hiding in his closet. So he come back in, and he was grumbling to his teammate and all this. Rawr, rawr, rawr. And he, I just wait for him to settle down and get sleeping in bed, and I open the closet door with the big bucket of ice, and I poured it on his bed, and I hightail it out of the room. He comes charging out. He couldn't find me. So I was a slow skater but a fast runner. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God! Uh, just bury the rug. You may won the goal, but you just got no soaked that night. In the Mo- Moscow. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Shocked. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't pregame busy. You pounced upon. Yeah, that was fucking scary. crazy that you yeah. did that. Yeah. I was, it was, what, what made you want to do it? Just for a the bunch hell? of beers. Oh, we were just having fun. We were just having fun. That's and, great. Uh, 
Remember the old hotel, when the hotel rooms, they, they used to have the mini bars in it? And the booze costs a fortune in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I still do. Yeah. and um, Inflation. Yeah. And, and so one time, uh, I was with Calgary, and once again, I go down. I put, actually put my suit back on for this when I went down, and I buffaloed the, the hotel people at the time that I needed a, a, a key to each each room, so I had to go do a room check. Oh my and so God. they give me a key. <laughs> and, and so I'm sneaking into the guy's rooms. Half of them are still out, and I have a pillowcase, and I'm cleaning out everybody's bar, uh, everybody's mini fridge, and I'm putting it in the pillowcase. And I can drink a lot of beer. I, I don't drink any alcohol or hard stuff. And so I... I wasn't getting it so I could continue drinking or anything. I was just getting it to bust the chops. And so the next day, the guys are checking out, oh, your bill will be $347. Or what the hell's going on? I didn't have anything for my mini bar. Meanwhile, I've got it all in my room. So, <laughs> but that's all good fun oh, yeah, prank absolutely. stuff there. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing like burning guys per diem. Yeah. I remember my, my first year, too. I would. The, I won't mention the name. He's like, "Hey, rookie, you you pay the room bill." And I'd never have anything to drink. Every time there's like four hundred, I was like, uh, "At some point, I, I I can't keep doing this." Bitch would have a heart attack. You think? Yeah, it was a nightmare. I was like, I might as well start drinking. At least I get something out of this. Yeah, you clear it out before he does. <laughs> well, this has been un- unbelievable. How long did we go? Ninety minutes. Yeah. Holy wow. shit! Yeah, this Holy is, and, and honestly, Marcy, like for for you to invite us here, and we can't wait till tomorrow yeah. and. He had an amazing career, two Stanley Cup finals, all that. And I think probably you'd even say what you're doing now and how you're helping these guys is pretty honorable and incredible to see. So thanks for joining us. Thank you. And actually, if I may, we'll go 135. <laughs> you, you brought it up early, the, the Warriors. Silver stick. Silver stick. Yeah. And that's a, so when I played my thousandth game, it was in Detroit, New Year's Eve. And uh, uh, Brian Murray was the coach GM at the time. So he kind of, I was an old guy, so he kind of, okay, you're going to, I knew I was playing that night. And so obviously my parents are down, my brother's big party planned. And, uh, and what a very special night. But so this, you know, Rodney Dangerfield of hockey, if you want to say, like, nobody from the NHL even showed up. Uh, let He's alone pigeon get, toss. So, you know, at that back in those days, you got a little crystal, but no one showed up from the NHL to present. I had to call the NHL up and say, hey, where's my little milestone? Excuse me, who are you? Oh, it's Brad Marsh, for heaven's sakes. Great stay-at-home defenseman. And uh, so they ended up sending me the, the crystal, which is good. I got it displayed. It's, you know, at that time, I was the, only the 16th defenseman in NHL history to play 1,000 games. No way. Yeah, which I thought, well, if you think about it, there's only six teams for the good part of yeah, it. Yeah, so anyhow, still, that's amazing. So anyhow, fast forward to the Warriors. Uh, <clears throat> somehow I was telling this story, and and uh, a couple of them, re- it, it stuck with them. And so they started take, uh, talking amongst themselves. And so they called the NHL. They got the exact people that make the silver sticks now when people hit a milestone. And so they ordered a silver stick, and they have each of the team's logos at Atlanta, Calgary, Flyers logos in, uh, in, engraved in it, and and uh, and of course they have the Flyers Warriors on the blade. And then we had a Christmas party at my house, and so everybody was at the house. I played Santa Claus; it was pretty cool. And uh, then they presented me with the silver stick, and it was it was very special, oh, very, sure. very very emotional. That's awesome. Yeah, you We're deserve that. Right, getting emotional now. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah. It was That's good. what it's about, yeah, man. It's, yeah, it's kind of it's, it's probably kind of good in a way that the NHL forgot, so you can have that yeah, moment later. Yeah, it's huh? good. So we got it up in the house. It weighs 26 pounds, so it wasn't like I could hang it up. Shows how much you mean to those guys, too, because they're the ones who thought about it and figured, let's get this done, right? That's cool. uh, No, so it's cool. And for the longest time, I didn't hang it up. I just left it at the front door so everybody that come over could see it and hold it and wow well, look at this is special but i got it up uh, on on the wall now and so it's, it's, it's as heavy cool. as the twig he had in that picture yeah. he showed us <laughs> it's as heavy as my wally yeah yeah well brad I got marsh paid five, i got paid 500 bucks for using that wally really yeah imagine that not too bad <laughs> <laughs> that paid for the van, sort of. Yeah, yeah, at least yeah. the, the gas. Well, congrats the on an domers. amazing career, and, and what you've done post-career is even more incredible. So yeah. thanks for joining the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. A lot All of right. fun. A lot of fun. Well, looking Thank forward you. to tomorrow. Thanks,
huge thanks to Brad Mash for joining us. Uh, terrific guy. We got to hang out with him a lot over the weekend. Everybody raves about how, how nice of a guy he is and what he does with the Philadelphia Warriors is, is such a great thing. And, you know, I've been friendly uh, with De- uh, Richie, Devin Richie on the team for a few years now. And uh, it was a special weekend for us guys. So, so thank you, Brad Mash. We appreciate it and hope to see you again soon. And we do want to tell you that interview was also brought to you by OCB Rowan Papers. Listen, gang, I made this switch a while back, and you should too. OCB rolling papers are the best I've used, and I promise you will not be disappointed. OCB is the largest rolling paper brand in the world and has been one with nature, crafted naturally since 1918, so you know they've perfected the process for a consistently great session time after time. And now's your chance to join the OCB family forever. OCB rolling papers are given a lifetime supply of rolling papers, cones, and some fresh swag to their loyal fans. Make sure to check out at OCB underscore USA today for a chance to win. All you have to do is follow on at OCB underscore USA on Instagram, like the OCB high hall post, and tag two friends in the comments to win. There's also a shortcut on OCBUSA.com slash chicklets with a link to enter on Instagram now. You must be 21 plus to buy the papers and follow the social accounts. Good luck. And again, if you make the switch, you'll never go back to whatever you were using before. OCB rolling papers. Get on them. Biz, we were just talking a little while ago. You have uh, Alexander Ovechkin as your MVP front runner right now. He had a hat trick Friday. He had another tuck Sunday. He had now his 273 power play goals, just one behind the all-time leader, Dave Anderchuk. I think you said you had Ovi, Leon, McDavid, and Markstrom in your top four MVP candidates right now. Yeah, listen, uh, Liam McHugh mentioned it probably two, maybe three weeks ago. And, you know, I was like, ah, I think, you know, Leon and McDavid are maybe a little bit more noticeable at that point. But given with what he's done with these guys out of the lineup, I think Mantha, oh, she has I've missed time. Obviously, Backstrom, his guy, hasn't been there. Um, the most fascinating stat was, and we know how hard it is to produce five on five nowadays, given structure, um, especially for these high end guys, because they're going against the, the best players from the other team every night. 24 five on five points. I think that the only guy in the league who has been on the ice for 24 or more even strength goals for their team was, I think I sent it to the group chat. Help me out here, RA. Uh, Biz, the play you were looking for was Aaron Ekblad of Florida. Wait, Panthers. what is the stat? That Alex only, will... go ahead. I'll let you yeah. tee it up, RA. Right? This is from uh, Dmitry Filipovich. Does a great job on Twitter. You should be following him. Uh, Ovechkin now has 24 five on five points. Five on five points this season. Aaron Ekblad is the only other player in the league who has even been on the ice for 24 of their team's five on five goals this season. I mean, that's so for so for strictly wow. talking MVP and heart and who's oh, been a yeah. valuable asset to their team. I think hands down through 20 games, you know, 25% of this season, it's going to be Alex Ovechkin. And some people are saying, Biz, you're fucking talking about the MVP 20 games in. I think it's f- insane given how young the league's going that a 36 year old is doing it. And with what we've been saying about McDavid and, and, and Leon as well. So uh, I just wanted to kind of beat that drum. And as I said, Liam McHugh was the first guy to it. I was a little hesitant, but I, over the last couple of weeks, even with more guys out of the lineup, he just is not slowing down and he is ready to go for this Olympic year, boys. That, that team is, we doubted them a little bit too. What the hell are we thinking? They don't even have Backstrom playing and they're playing this well, but he's, he has 18 assists. That's how many he had all of last year in 45 games. And the year before that, in 68 games, he had 19 assists. So um, to be scoring the way he always does, actually, he's even at a better rate than normal. Uh, and then adding the assists, he's the MVP right now. I think McDavid and Dreisaitl, as good as they've been, it's like they take away from one another when you see what this guy's doing. So they're tracking his trajectory, my favorite word in the English dictionary, and he's actually on pace for his best season ever. As a player yeah. at 36 years old. And wait, I forgot to mention this when you were uh, stroking off Brad Marchand. I think there, there's he's the 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 only player other than Lemieux and Gretzky to average over a point a game since he's turned 30 years old. And they were like 1.67 or they were over. You have the stat already? Yeah, Biz. Uh, after two points Sunday night, Brad Marchand has 280 points in 220 games since the start of his 30-year-old season. It comes out to 1.27 per game. 
There are two players with more points per game and at least 200, 200 games played in their 30s. Wayne Gretzky at 1.69, nice. And Mario Lemieux <laughs> at 1.62. So, you know, I know it's a very specific stat, but uh, like this guy's producing in his 30s when, you know, guys t- typically fall off. So it's been impressive as hell. And Ovechkin, man, absolute treat to watch him. Bucci thinks he's going to break 1,000 goals. I don't know. I mean, thousand? I'd be, I'd, yeah, Bucci thinks the way, because he's so durable, man. I mean, if he plays till he's 43, 44 years old, I don't think it's inconceivable. I don't know him well enough to know how Seven much he from now, absolutely man, loves the game to where he's going to want to put the gear on at, uh, you know, at 42, 43. We know that, that Chara can do it. You got to be a little bit, you got to be a little bit squirrely to want to be competing at the NHL, I guess, at that age. I don't know enough about him, but I know that he's probably, I, I can't say I know if I'm, if I then say the word probably, but you got to think the goal record he has his sights on. So once he breaks that and, and maybe he's 40, when that happens, if he continues at this pace, he needs what over a hundred more 150 ish more. So after that, would he be like, all right, I I'm, I'm done. I got my cup. I got the best record ever in hockey. And, and, I, 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 or am I looking for a thousand? I don't know. That's crazy to think that he could get a thousand that he'd need 251 more. And he's 36. <sighs> If he gets 65 this year and then next year gets like 50 again, then you're like, okay, we're, we're looking at a thousand. When he breaks yeah. the record, he's just going to skate off the ice. You're never going to see or hear from That's him. That's it. Again. Little peace sign. We're out. He's playing, told- for, he's playing for Dynamo Moscow the uh, next day. Mike Green was telling when we played under 18 together, he said that he had this Russian come over. You know, you know they used to draft, uh, they used to have two rounds of the European draft for all the CHL teams. And they had this filthy Russian come over, and he was there for um, uh, training camp. And the first preseason game, he went to pick him up, and he you know, goes to the door and you know rings the doorbell. And then finally, he comes out. He's like, "Yeah, I'm not going to the, the exhibition game." So he's like, "Okay." So he goes to the rink, goes in the coach stuff. He says, "Hey, the Russian said he's not coming to the game." So they end up sent over an intern. They grab him. Finally, they get him over. They get him out for warm up. I guess the first period, he had two goals, two of the filthiest goals that Mike Green had ever seen. Between periods, he took off his gear, went home. They never saw him again. <laughs> what was the kid's name? No clue. No clue. I don't know. It was, it was their import Russian. This is, I mean, this is going back, what, 15 years? I played under yeah, 18 yeah, yeah. with Green. But he was telling me about this story. And I'm like, that's, you know, because we, I think in junior, everybody has a, a, a European story of a guy coming over and, uh, and, and something wacky happening. We had a guy, Tomas Chabi, on our team. I've told the story on here before, too, with uh, Chris Thorburn. He was, uh, he was back checking Thorby and Thorby's skate came up. It slid his lip. Like when he would close his mouth, you could see his front teeth. It was just flopping over. And it was, a, yeah, it was a pretty traumatic experience. And I think like a, a week or two later after that, he was gone back home too. So yeah, I just, uh, I don't know how we got there. Nah, we always wonder what you biz. That's, that's what makes us uh, spit and chicklets, buddy. Oh, it was Ovi just saying peace after he breaks the goal scoring record. Talking about snipers, congrats to Joe Pavelski. He nets his 400th goal, becoming just the 11th American to do so. And over the last 15 seasons, only Ovechkin, Stamkos, Crosby, Kane, and Malkin have more goals than Pavelski. Uh, Daryl Ray had an interesting tweet. Uh, More Americans have walked on the moon than have scored 400 goals in the NHL. Patrick Kane is currently the active leader with 410, but Pavelski still getting it done at his age with fucking this guy another one maybe unheralded because he was in san jose for so long but just the fucking great net front presence great score yeah we've we've talked about him a long time my new thing is if dallas uh struggles is who's going to get him at the deadline what a pickup that would be that's kind of what i'm focused on he's just a playoff performer gamer so i've said it before he's great at everything he's a really good person good guy from the times i've got to meet with him and play with him a little bit and it's no surprise because when he came into the league you already knew he was like pretty quickly one of the best tippers in in the entire league like if he's in front of the net any puck that's near him with his hand eye, he's getting a piece of. He scores. He he's scored a ton of his 400. Just nice tips, nice deflections in the slot, right in the crease. So he's able to do that, and then he kept getting better and better and more confidence. And the career he's had has been remarkable. And there was a, a great clip of his old teammate Brent Burns uh, pulling up to a game. He looked like Pa Kent from Soup Man. That was like a 1950s red pickup truck. He's a fucking absolute beauty. What did he have in that backpack? I want to know like, what is in the backpack. Like, is. He eats uh, lamb shanks between periods. <laughs> it's a couple live chickens. Yeah, he gets, he gets those. <laughs> it's like uh, what's the guy Serrano from Major League? Oh yeah, Joe Boo. <laughs> up your butt, Joe Boo. <laughs> 
That's a fucking great movie. Uh, all right, let's see. Uh, Chris Russell uh, of Edmonton now has the most block shots ever. Uh, he recorded six in Saturday's game versus Vegas to pass Brent Seabrook. He now is 2003. He's the first player in history to pass 2000. Uh, dude, this guy, you know, I guess he never complains. It was, I think it was, uh, I don't know, Kelly Rudy maybe talking about him. He was his teammate. He's like, this guy never complains. He just eats pucks. Like, great teammate, great guy. Any guy, any of you guys play with him? Or, I mean, you must well, I, I, he, he's, he's an anomaly. And I got a message from uh, uh, Jim Playfair. And he goes, Biz, he goes, he's going to break this record. And he goes, look at his junior career. He was, a, he was an offensive defenseman. That's like the last thing an offensive defenseman wants to do is block shots. Ask yeah, Keith, sure. <laughs> ask Yance. He'll be up front about ask it. Him me. and Boyd Gordon had a fuck you match uh, in the middle of the locker room about blocking shots. <laughs> and he'll retell the story next time he's on. But, I mean, adapt your game. And he ended up making, what, $33 million doing it? So congratulations to him. One of the hardest jobs on the team is, you know, is being a defensive defenseman who's going to eat pucks for his team. And, um, you know, he, he's, earned, he's earned every penny. Yeah, and he changed his game. That's more important. He realized what was going to work. He got to Columbus trying to be the power play guy from junior. I think he was defenseman of the year in the CHL, if not yeah. the MVP of the WHL. And then he quickly kind of understood that's not how I'm going to play in this league. Yeah, and then he completely changed everything up and went into a shot blocking shutdown type role. And he's done at Calgary. It was Dallas, right? Edmonton now. And I think at times um, he's catch he's caught some heat from the from the fan base. And I believe it was an article by Robin Brownlee, who, who was an Edmonton guy and, and writer, and mentioned that um, who was the coach there a few years ago? He, he was now in L.A. Oh, uh, Jesus! What the hell. Todd McClellan. Todd McClellan. And he came out and said, any of you fans who are bad mouth from this guy and, and don't think that he's a big part of this team and, and a huge, you know, like play, he's a huge player for this team, not only on the ice, but the way he is off the ice. He's such a professional. If you're booing him, you're a clown. So to get defense like that in the media from a head coach isn't that common. Uh, sticking with the Oilers for a sec, we got to give props to this guy uh, at Biz Robbie uh, 1199 for his Oilers cave wit. He apparently got one of your old sticks at a sale, and that, what a fucking man cave that is! You got to check yeah, it out. Yeah, he should have stopped. He, he went. He went through his basement pretty quick. So you couldn't tell, but I mean, look to be fifty jerseys, sticks. Uh, old seats at, Re at Rexall place at the old arena. He just had it all. So maybe I can watch the, the Stanley Cup finals with that guy. When they dummy Toronto, he, he might, he might kidnap me though. I'd be like a Celtic pride situation. <laughs> <laughs> you ever seen oh, that movie? Shit. Biz? Yeah. I think I've seen it. Yeah. I filmed it right around the block. Uh, okay, let's see. The Fenway Sports Group, they signed a purchase agreement to take controlling stake in the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, Ron Burkle and Mario Lemieux will remain part of the ownership. Lemieux will still run hockey ops. Senior management stays in place. Basically, just another toy for John Henry, who owns the Red Sox. And uh, what team does he own? And what soccer team does he Liverpool. own? With? Liverpool. Liverpool. Okay. Yeah, just another, I mean, you know, just another rich guy buying a team. By the way, uh, I think in 99... Lemieux and Ron Burkle bought, I think it was 110 million. And so 20, 20 years later, 22 years later, it's 900 million. So not a bad return on your investment, I guess. Yeah. Mar Mario saved the team a couple times. Biz, y'all looking pretty sharp there today. What do you got? What do you got wearing there? All right. These are the NBD track Cetos that we came up with. We were doing uh, some testing of materials for quite some time. We finally found a really, really nice cotton. It launders very well. Uh, it's extremely high quality. And I want to thank G because he was one of the guys who helped me with it. I think the colors turned out great. Uh, we have this uh, kind of like this matte gray. We have a charcoal black and then we have a nice blue. Um, guys, these are perfect for lounging around the house, uh, whether you're watching football. I travel in these now. Uh, check them out if you're into a high quality sweatpants. The sweat pant that launders properly and it's not going to uh, shrink too much. It holds its form. It's got quality elastic bands. It's got a great hood. They got the crew neck. So check them out. I love them. Uh, I'm sending some over to you guys. So you guys let me know what you think, but uh, definitely high quality and something that I, uh, I'm a bit of a clothes snob, all right? I, I'm, uh, I got to make sure my clothes launder properly and they don't shrink too much. So uh, these are the real deal. This NBD. was like a year in the making biz too. Like, let's not downplay this. Like you've been testing materials and trying things. Well, on. cause they send you, it's hard. Cause you're trying to keep the, 
the price points down for your fans, but yet you want to have something that you want to rock and that's higher quality. You know, I don't have a ton of clothes. I just like having high quality clothes because I'm a big material guy. And the the cotton that we were able to get on these sweatpants and get the cost down and the fit perfect, I think people are going to be very happy. And we're going to continue to take your feedback and try to improve these NBD tracksitos to the best of their uh, capability. So you'll probably see me rocking them when we're at the the, the ball hockey uh, whether we're at uh, the the party we got coming for uh, for New Year's at the outdoor game, the Winter Classic, wherever you see me, Chicklets fans, I'll usually be rocking this tracksito. And uh, they're even gum repellent. So if you're a fan at one of these events sticking huh. gum on my arsehole, uh-uh. Gum uh-uh. repellent. <laughs> well, uh, there were some other clothes that dropped recently that not everybody liked. Uh, the Olympic jerseys for the United States team. Granelli did a great blog about it. They just look like ugly Christmas sweaters or ugly soccer kits. Like, I don't know, man. I know they got to make some new dough, but they, they just didn't impress me or, or too many people. Gee, you, did, you didn't like them at all. Yeah, I mean, you're looking at Witt's Olympic jersey behind him. I just have always said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Like, those jerseys were awesome. I know they're trying to make some money, but, like, I look at Sweden. Sweden never really changes their jerseys. Like, th- those USA jerseys, the one Witt's looking at now, it's clean. It's right to the point. It's when they won. They wore them in 1980. They won. Won a silver medal when Witt wore them. So it's I, – I just don't understand why USA ev- – they have four years to make these jerseys, and they keep putting these shitty jerseys out there. It doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, now, now sometimes they look a little bit different when they put them on. And I'll, I'll, I'll go back to last week. We were talking about the new New Jersey – third jerseys uh, i thought the, i thought those grew a lot on me once i saw them on uh, on the guys but i think that the usa ones look like soccer kits and i'm not going to yeah be they do hip- look like soccer they look like soccer kits and i'm not going to be a hypocrite here i didn't really like the leaf on the new canadian ones either it's too modern and Grinelli, I, i'm going to reiterate what you said if it ain't broke don't fix it so many amazing old school team canada jerseys or even even some of the more later ones were not bad. This one I thought missed the mark, and uh, I don't know how many uh, uh, Canadians out there shame, share the same opinion as me. I think I think it was Roshinsky said it looks like the the arsehole of a turkey. Yeah, pocket butthole. <laughs> That's something it, like that. Yeah, and it does. It, it, it does. Uh, I, I, I think, think the 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 dark blue of USA is all right. Uh, the white I didn't love. the The light blue one is brutal. That's the word. I don't even know if they'll wear that one, but yeah, it, soccer kit and and just basically like going away from what's worked and what I enjoy. I'm a more simple guy on jerseys, like not loud and 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 I feel like USA they tried a little bit too hard to make it more modern, as you say, with the leaf up in Canada biz. I guess that's a good word. The the the, le- the jerseys are not old school by any means. I think Germany always kills it with their uniforms. The, uh, the black, black, yellow, and red, they always come out with some nice stuff. Uh, keeping with the Olympics here, uh, Pierre Lebrun had an article in The Athletic of the Olympics in jeopardy. Uh, I don't know if it's panic or what. He said, in the event that the NHL and the NHLPA pull out of the Olympics, what about the rest of the schedule with three weeks off? Uh, my sense is, this is Pierre talking, my sense is it wouldn't be a total rejig, perhaps give the players a week off and use rest to lighten some tough schedule situations for some teams, just a possibility. Again, the plan remains to go to the Olympics as of now. January 10th is the opt-out deadline for the NHL and the NHLPA. But if for whatever reason they pull out, there's a gap in the schedule to use some de- use to some degree, but players would still get a break. Uh, and that kind of sort of ties in with the All-Star game as well. Emily Captain was saying the NHLPA is asking for tighter protocols in Vegas for All-Star weekend. They asked the NHL to take over some of the planning for players, like staying at a hotel with no casino. The protocols are to be determined. She said, Emily said she's hearing more trepidation about going. One player she talked to said, a few test positive in China, you're stuck there for three weeks. That's brutal. Guys are terrified of that. Then, of course, when you come home, you have to quarantine again when you get back to North America, which is an absolute nightmare scenario. Um, you know, I don't know if this is chick a little stuff, but you know, this is stuff that potentially happens, especially what we just heard about with Carolina with. Yeah. And it goes into, even at the all-star game, I think players have asked to be, be away from like the strip and not have a hotel that there's a casino in the lobby and try to at least like make sure that they don't get stuck getting COVID in, in Vegas. So I, the, the Olympics, the GMs and the owners, they don't want the teams to go. And now it's like it's tenfold with how bad they don't want them to go with being stuck over there. If you happen to not only could you could you test positive and be out of the games, you're then stuck there for three weeks. Who wants to be in China for three weeks? Are you shitting me? I I think that if you look, 
you look right now, it'll still happen. But now you see Carolina's got a couple guys. The Islanders games gets postponed. If that happens again, you might see teams and, and, and owners really speak up against guys going and even players. Now there's probably a chance. Some of them don't want to go in the end though. I still think that guys want the break, the big Olympic break and the players who are going to make their, their teams, they, they'd love the chance to play for gold medal. That's everyone's dream, but um, it just seems like it's becoming harder and harder. And, and now if it were to get canceled, I'm a, I'd be a lot less surprised than, than a month ago. Gary Bettman's been adamant about the fact that he didn't, I don't think he wanted them going to the Olympics this no. year. He said that they wanted to do, go, so he's allowing them to go if, if they want. He wants to get all these the, the revenues back up. He wants the All Star Game to happen. My only question was going to be like the 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 penalization for not going to the All Star Game if you're selected is a one game suspension. Correct? They might have advanced it to two games because maybe some guys were like ah oh, one game. But if these guys are going to the Olympics, either way, the the ones who probably would more likely not want to go to the All Star Game before heading to the Olympics you're going to want that one game of rest when you get back anyway. So fucking take the suspension. So I don't know, maybe I was thinking maybe do like a, a year where you don't get the guys going to the Olympics at the all-star game. But I would imagine a lot of people would be upset at the fact that they don't get to see the league stars. They get to see this, the second wave. So I don't I think know. that uh, biz the, they have a plane, like a huge yes, private charter. jet going from Vegas. So that changes it a little bit. And also if you were to cancel the Olympics, and still give the guys a week off. Well, all of a sudden you you have to, we've talked about figuring out the schedule and the basketball. And like, is it that easy to reschedule games all of a sudden and, and, and put games into the two weeks when they, when they plan on being no, no NHL. So it's probably easier said than done in terms of like changing this entire plan. Yeah. This is definitely a moving story though. In a month's time, we might be singing a different tune given, given with the, the COVID rules and all this, this stuff. So uh, we'll when did keep they say they're going to name the teams? Has there been wow. any word on like when these countries would name their squads? It's got to be pretty soon, right? Yeah, I'm, I don't know the date offhand. I know they had to name th- you know, three players a while back. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, I don't know when the evaluation stuff stops. But yeah, obviously, we're going to keep tabs on it, see what happens. And, you know, we, we hope they get over there. But obviously, concerns are legitimate. You don't want to be stuck in a foreign country with, with COVID and quarantine and then have to do it when you get home. So, hey, guys, it happens sometimes. It's not ideal. And we've all tried different ways to last longer. But thinking about Ovi's goal totals or whatever doesn't always delay things the way we'd like. Well, the folks at Roman, an online men's health company, are changing the game with Roman Swipes, the secret to longer-lasting sex. Roman Swipes are a clinically proven way to last longer in bed. They're effective, easy to use, fast-acting, and the best part, they do not require a prescription, so you don't have to walk in CVS and everybody knows you not too soon. That does not happen. Roman can ship swipes to you in discreet, unmarked packaging, and each swipes packet is small enough to hide in your wallet for whenever you need it. They're super easy to use. You just take the swipes out of the packet, swipe it on, make sure to let it dry, and you're good to good to good to go. That's it. So go to GetRoman.com slash chicklets and you get your first month of swipes for just $5 when you choose a monthly plan. That's GetRoman.com slash chicklets. Uh, all right, boys, moving right along here. Uh, Connor McDavid had a nice little house tour with his uh, girlfriend, Lauren. Pre- pretty pretty cool stuff. If you boys were going to design a house from scratch, what would be the essentials that you would need? First three things absolutely you have to have in a brand new house from scratch. A bidet. Ha, I had that written down too. Heated seat, water. Hey, warm Ed, Ed, Ed Jovanovsky had a uh, urinal, which was nice. Yes, I've I've wanted a urinal. I've been told no. Um, oh, <laughs> by you got the woman in my life. It's tough yeah, to sit. Like, yeah, on a, yeah. To well, sit. I mean, like, I, I, like you could it, squat over it. Because in the middle of the night when I piss and check bets, you know, the 2.30 a.m. wake up I've talked about, I sit down because I'm just so to lunch and like it's dark, right? So just give me a urinal. I can just lean my forehead against the wall, do my business and crawl back into bed. It's kind of be yeah, a big wall. Pass out, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this water's cold, man. Oh, man. Uh, uh, I have this. Uh, this uh, You're in the process of doing this, Biz. Yeah, I have a coffee maker that I got. <laughs> That is incredible, and I I I don't know free ads. I don't want to say it, but it like crushes the beans, and the you 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 know you pat it down, you put the thing in there, it pours out the espresso shots. That would be one thing that I would definitely need in my house. Uh, I I have my inversion table that's just off screen here, 
which yeah, helps you, me it, out. It, it, that's the most expensive clothes ha- uh, clothes rack you have at your house, dude. No, I, I every go, time I, I've been there, there's just clothes hanging on it. Well, it's it's the I'm getting teed up for the for the wardrobes for the Chicklets podcast. All the stuff, all the oh, free okay. merch that Grinelli's sending me. Uh, but as far as other stuff, I mean, I think that a, a big one in my next home is going to be a steamer, a steam room. You know, you, and not, after a night of boozing. That's what that was the best thing about going to the rink, especially after the night of booze. And you could even grab a steamer before uh, practice. We talk about uh, Chris Chelios and how he used to go in there with the fucking bike to sweat out all the booze. So that would uh, that would definitely be the numero uno on the list right now would be a steam room in my house. What about I, got you? A steam, I got a steam room. I don't use it that much. Uh, it gets really hot, too. It's great. I don't know why. I just feel so brutal after I get out of it. Like brutal. Maybe I should do it before bed. All right, you would have to say a movie theater. Infrared in sauna, though, for me. Dude, literally, what I had down is a movie theater room, just like Tony Soprano had. Remember when, like, come out and all the girls would put a movie on? They have like all those comfy chairs, the big screen, hundred percent of a fucking uh, top of the. You don't line want the Phil Castle one? Well, I'd have one of those for my, you know, for when <laughs> going on fucking. For, with your herbal active cream next to your <laughs> on your table keep the G, swelling down uh, G, what about, well, let's see what g would do for us for a new, a new pad i'll keep it simple i just i want an elevator and i want a doorman because that means no mice and rats can get into my apartment elevator you'll, you'll be sick of that thing in a unless you i think he's saying in, in a building in new york he wants in a elevator. building in new york because I, I i gotta take a new york uh blend on this so i'm saying i need a doorman i need an elevator because that's there's no rats in those buildings Okay. Oh, here's another one for you guys. Uh, I, I think even G would like this. Um, golden tea. I'd love to have a yeah, big golden, golden tea great. system in my basement. So when the boys are over having a couple pops, you can play that. I what got the old uh, Pac-Man, yeah, you... the original Pac-Man. Oh, and it's, really? Gal- it's, it's Galaga too. So it's like you shoot. It's two different games. Jonesy, had, Jonesy had the video game at his uh, beat. His pool yes, he did. Yeah, did he? It, it, it wasn't the the, st- the big console, the stand up one. It was oh, the he had the sit down one, one from yeah. like Papa Gino's when you were little and shit. Yeah, yeah they used Don to have Don. it at Pizza Hut and some of the ones in in Canada. Hey, get this! I forgot to. This isn't. This is separate from the house, but I just thought of this. So, uh, I got. I'm on a group text that does like football pools. Like every week, everyone they send in like picks against the spread, and whoever wins the most, right? It's hundred bucks a guy or something like that. So, on that group text, Fairway Falls, our boy Brian Foley writes on uh it must have been saturday morning like three red alarm emojis three bulldozers and three basketballs attention breaking news five star lock of the year new mexico basketball over thousand tonight and, and like i'm like what the fuck like what does he know about anything about especially college basketball what's he talking about so I don't even think anyone ever responded to it. A couple of guys responded to it, but nobody said, all right, I'm on them with you. Well, sure enough, I didn't take it because I know Foley's a complete mush. I didn't take it, but the game started. They went down 15 nothing. So all of a sudden, the group text is like, <laughs> great start, Foles. Uh, what the hell's going on? I check, oh, my God. Now, Foley doesn't respond. So I know this kid. I know fairways as well as anyone, I feel like. I knew immediately this goon called out this lock of the year and isn't even watching it. He's asleep. Sure as shit, he never responded to any text. He did not watch the game. He was dead asleep. The next day, we come to find out, not only did he give this loser pick out of the clouds for no reason, he had a cousin on Towson, the team that New Mexico was playing against, and his cousin had a career high twenty five points. <laughs> what a mush! What a donkey! <laughs> Bets against his cousin's team in a lock of the century for a twenty person group text, and the cousin ends up going off for twenty five. And if you know Foley, dude, he's a steak, he's a meat and potatoes type guy. His cousin's actually last name was Timberlake. I'm like, how do you have a cousin with the last name Timberlake who's dropping 25 points in a D1 college basketball game? So just a ridiculous story out of Fairway Falls this weekend. <laughs> hey, was he even aware that his cousin was playing against the team he was betting on? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I guess New Mexico is very good at home, but the game was in Vegas. So like it was like a neutral site. So who knows if he even knew that? But hey, when he when I found out he had the cousin, I just lost it. I was hey, dying laughing. Throw that in the things that I want in my place. Is is one of those uh, the basketball hoops next to the other guy where you go when the clock oh, starts. So Murley Papa says he's shot. the best player in the world to pop a shot, but I love that game. There's one at Barstow we did. Um, going back to McDusty's place, I thought his girl nailed it. 
It was, it was great. I mean, it's a, it had a modern flair to it. Obviously it went with the outside and blended well to the interior. Um, yeah. I, I thought it was fun. I've always, he, look at this beautiful yeah. view. <laughs> yeah. How many, pops that's my city. Think, that's the river Valley. Hey, how many pops do you think they've had inside that hot tub after wins in, uh, in Edmonton so far? I, I would love to hang out with him after wins. Maybe I can get the invite during the cup finals. <laughs> um, talking about college, uh, college bet and college basketball bet. Have you seen this documentary on Netflix yet? It's there's a series called Bad Sport. Uh, yeah, I watched that. The Arizona State yeah, kid, Arizona State one, biz. It's, it's good. It was back in the '90s. They basically this, you know, one of the players get into the bookies, and so they started shaving points. And you know, the because they caught him because the because there were so many regulators in Nevada, they saw there were so many weird discrepancies and bets coming, and they knew something was up. And uh, yeah, they basically like busted him. One kid went to jail, ruined his career. He was probably going to be a first round pick, but it was, it's pretty interesting. Check it out. Yeah. Bad sport. I think it's, yeah, he got, he got in bad with some bookies early on and and they basically said, we, you know, we got a way that you can get out of this thing. And, uh, and, and sure enough, he was a star point point guard at the school. And yeah, I, I actually started watching that one. I never, never finished it, but definitely an interesting story. But I don't know if the kid ever had fans removed from a game like LeBron did. did. Did you guys see that clip? Yeah, Le- LeBron yeah, did it come out what out. they said? He he didn't say specifically. Then there were some other reports saying that they supposedly mentioned his kid, like some some about his his son, whatever. I don't know. Like that's the thing. What's off limits? I mean, there are pros. People are gonna say shit, but you know, uh, guys probably hear worse than that. I've never seen players specifically point guys out and, and say throw them out. I mean, obviously, if it's really truly offensive stuff, yeah. But I don't know what what they said. They didn't. I actually. think if you're a fan sitting courtside and you're chirping at the players, you're a fucking loser. That like goes you're without saying. You, like you're like it, it's so bizarre too because you're just right there. So like I mean, this has happened before. I want to say Westbrook has had guys kicked out. Uh, there was an incident game one of the season with the Lakers. But some of the the shit that these fans are yelling at these players, like they shouldn't have to put up with that. I get if it's coming. Like I used to have a guy sit uh, right right where the tunnel was in L.A. and he used to just bark at me all game. And I would say some mean shit back to him, like I could handle it. But you know, there it's a little bit different when there's the glass separation and or the, the the stairs. But these guys are just like standing right there, and 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 I would imagine it was a, enough for him to be like, okay, I'm not I'm not going to handle that because he's probably getting yelled at every re- arena that he goes to. So obviously, if they cross the line, he's saying, "Fuck this! I run the league. Get these people out of here." Man, he sure does. Uh, let's see here. Have you any of you guys been able to check out that Beatles doc on Disney Plus yet? Um, no, but I'm Peter interested. Jackson. Yeah, I, I put it on one night, but I, I shut it off. I didn't last to it, but it's real. Yeah, real interesting. Peter Jackson, the director, he, he, they, he got this old footage of the Beatles like right before they were breaking up and they were making, I think, their last album. And it's a real fly on the wall thing. I mean, the Beatles aren't my favorite band. I obviously respect them, what they did, the huge role of rock history. But people who have watched it have been have been raving about it because it's, it's just footage that you've never seen before. And it, it gives a whole new perspective on, on why they broke up because uh, at the time they did it, they weren't all getting along. But it's just so interesting to see how music gets made and like the creative process. It's, it's pretty cool shit. Would yeah, you would you put out. them as the biggest band ever? Is is that oh, the Fugees. <laughs> Are they the biggest yeah. band ever? All yeah, right. I, I'm a I'm I'm a diehard Stones guy, but I, I I give props to the Beatles. Yeah, they yeah, they got here first. I you know they got to America. Terry Ryan first. said the same thing, and that's yeah. why he's got the tattoo. Yeah, I, I'm like I'm not even a, a, a really a big Beatles fan. I don't even have any on the, any of their albums, but I like them. I like their music. I respect what they've done, and yeah, they are the biggest band ever. They they changed the world. They changed music history, and I I have no problem saying that. Okay, I uh, I, I got to check that out. I've recently been. I can't stand current movies for the most part. I'm not into um, like the Marvel stuff. Oh. I, I've never enjoyed, but now it's just I don't know like. So I went back. I was like, I'm going to just start watching old movies I haven't seen. They're unreal. Dude, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Watched that the other night. Phenomenal flick. Like Al Pacino. It's these guys selling real estate. It's based on a play. Had a blast watching that movie. Then I found um, All the President's Men. Dustin Hoffman, Robert Redford. Unreal. I've been watching these at night. Like after I watch like the hockey games, I'll throw these on. You're turning into the, RA. Finishing the net. Yes, kind I'm of getting, RA. I'm, I'm getting, switching to I'm RA. Hard right now. Uh, then I ended up. Then I ended up. I'd seen them. Before, Get your hand out of your pants, RA. Godfather one and Godfather two. Godfather two might be the best movie ever. Yeah. Like of all time. But I, I'm just on a kick now. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch a Dead Poets Society's my next one. Um, 
So just like I think the movies were better. Like, am I a, am I a boomer? The movies were just they were more original. They were just I don't know. I I, I don't find many movies nowadays that I enjoy. So I'm going back in time. Yeah, the '70s were a great era. That's when the directors kind of took control of things. They had so much creative freedom, and you know, the '80s, the studios took back over. But so many tremendous movies. There's another one uh, between The Godfather and Godfather Part Two. Francis Ford Coppola made a movie called The Conversation, starring Gene Hackman. He's like a, a guy who bugs people and listens in on conversations. And it's crazy to think he made Godfather, The Conversation, then Godfather Part Two. Yeah, all all of them nominated for Best Picture. Give that one a whirl. It might be a little slower, but. If you're looking for a vintage 70s movie, what try that one out. There. I don't care if a movie's slow as long as the yeah. acting and cinematography are good. Yeah. I, uh, that's why I could probably watch There Will Be Blood once a week. Oh, I watched that last week, dude. That movie, he, oh, I drink your milk. Yikes. So fucking good. He's incredible. That movie that. is incredible. That guy, I wish he acted more. I know he's oh, Well, he's done. Too. He retired. That's yeah. like the sad, when he announced that, it's like one of the saddest things ever. It's like he's the, he's the best actor, male actor of all time. I, I think he's twice as good as Leo, and I think Leo's the next best. Yeah, I'm not going to dispute. Give another one. Uh, what? Give Thief a world. James Conn plays. A, he's a jewel thief. Back, it was uh, Michael Mann who directed Heat. It's his first movie. Tremendous right. movie. Thief. Can't recommend right. it enough. But all right, boys. Uh, once again, we want to remind you the Sandbaggers dropping uh, Wednesday night. What time did we say, G? 6 p.m. Eastern time. 6 p.m. with Trevor Zegers and Cole Caulfield. Good stuff presented by Pink Whitney we and need Roman. to win one of these fucking sandbaggers. And uh, also, me. we want to thank everybody who, who's purchased our, our gear for Black Friday over the weekend. We still got Cyber Monday to go. We can't thank you enough. The support means uh, the world to us. Uh, we love you guys. And uh, any f- final thoughts from the fellas or what? Um, no, Wednesday night, I'm looking forward to watching Biz because it's uh, Pittsburgh at Edmonton. Crosby, uh, McDavid will be a fun one to catch. And watch Biz line, look like a fool, like a prom. What's outfit this week? That I'll NGD just, track just, 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 just trying to recover from, from the black on black there, the, the, the prom suit. The but uh, the Clouseau suit. <laughs> but I'm excited. We got McDavid the most uh, of, of any team on TNT this year and uh, looking forward. I don't know if uh, Wayno's not quite back yet, but I'm sure he'll be there in spirit. And uh, for all those of you, for, oh, for fuck's sake. For all of you TNT. who watch or bought our merch, we appreciate you. Thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy it because we love doing the show. I hope you enjoy the show and, that's about all I got right now. It's a season of being thankful. Absolutely. Well, we're thankful for you and have a fantastic week, everybody. Take care.